This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more here, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 10 through 12. Chapter 10. A Bosom Friend. Returning to the Spouter Inn from the chapel, I found Queequeg there quite alone, he having left the chapel before the benediction some time. He was sitting on a bench before the fire, with his feet on the stove-hearth, and in one hand was holding close to his face that little negro idol of his, peering hard into its face, and with a jackknife gently whittling away at its nose, meanwhile humming to himself in his heathenish way. But being now interrupted, he put up the image, and pretty soon, going to the table, took up a large book there, and placing it on his lap, began counting the pages with deliberate regularity, at every fiftieth page, as I fancied, stopping a moment, looking vacantly around him, and giving utterance to a long-drawn gurgling whistle of astonishment. He would then begin again at the next fifty, seeming to commence at the number one each time, as though he could not count more than fifty, and it was only by such a large number of fifties being found together that his astonishment at the multitude of pages was excited. With much interest I sat watching him. Savage though he was, and hideously marred about the face, at least to my taste, his countenance yet had something in it which was by no means disagreeable. You cannot hide the soul. Through all his unearthly tattooings I thought I saw the traces of a simple, honest heart, and in his large, deep eyes, fiery black and bold, there seemed tokens of a spirit that would dare a thousand devils. And besides all this there was a certain lofty bearing about the pagan, which even his uncouthness could not altogether maim. He looked like a man who had never cringed and had never had a creditor. Whether it was, too, that his head being shaved, his forehead was drawn out in freer and brighter relief, and looked more expansive than it otherwise would, this I will not venture to decide, but certain it was his head was phrenologically an excellent one. It may seem ridiculous, but it reminded me of General Washington's head, as seen in the popular busts of him. It had the same long, regularly graded, retreating slope from above the brows, which were likewise very projecting, like two long promontories thickly wooded on top. Queequeg was George Washington cannibalistically developed. Whilst I was thus closely scanning him, half pretending meanwhile to be looking out at the storm from the casement, he never heeded my presence, never troubled himself with so much as a single glance, but appeared wholly occupied with counting the pages of the marvellous book. Considering how sociably we had been sleeping together the night previous, and especially considering the affectionate arm I had found thrown over me waking in the morning, I thought this indifference of his very strange. But savages are strange beings. At times you do not know exactly how to take them. At first they are overawing, their calm self-collectedness of simplicity seems a Socratic wisdom. I had noticed also that Queequeg never consorted at all, or but very little, with the other seamen in the inn. He made no advances whatever, appeared to have no desire to enlarge the circle of his acquaintances. All this struck me as mighty singular, yet upon second thoughts there was something almost sublime in it. Here was a man some twenty thousand miles from home, by way of Cape Horn, that is, which was the only way he could get there, thrown among people as strange to him as though he were in the planet Jupiter. And yet he seemed entirely at his ease, preserving the utmost serenity, content with his own companionship, always equal to himself. Surely this was a touch of fine philosophy, though no doubt he had never heard there was such a thing as that. But perhaps, to be true philosophers, we mortals should not be conscious of so living or so striving. So soon as I hear that such and such a man gives himself out for a philosopher, I conclude that, like the dyspeptic old woman, he must have broken his digester. As I sat there in that now lonely room, the fire burning low in that mild stage when, after its first intensity has warmed the air, it then only glows to be looked at, the evening shades and phantoms gathering round the casements, and peering in upon us silent, solitary twain, 
the storm booming without in solemn swells, I began to be sensible of strange feelings. I felt a melting in me. No more my splintered heart and maddened hand were turned against the wolfish world. This soothing savage had redeemed it. There he sat, his very indifference speaking a nature in which there lurked no civilized hypocrisies and bland deceits. Wild he was, a very sight of sights to see, yet I began to feel myself mysteriously drawn towards him. And those same things that would have repelled most others, they were the very magnets that thus drew me. I'll try a pagan friend, thought I, since Christian kindness has proved but hollow courtesy. I drew my bench near him, and made some friendly signs and hints, doing my best to talk with him meanwhile. At first he little noticed these advances, but presently, upon my referring to his last night's hospitalities, he made out to ask me whether we were again to be bedfellows. I told him yes, whereat I thought he looked pleased, perhaps a little complimented. We then turned over the book together, and I endeavoured to explain to him the purpose of the printing, and the meaning of the few pictures that were in it. Thus I soon engaged his interest, and from that we went to jabbering the best we could about the various outer sights to be seen in this famous town. Soon I proposed a social smoke, and producing his pouch and tomahawk, he quietly offered me a puff. And then we sat exchanging puffs from that wild pipe of his, and keeping it regularly passing between us. If there yet lurked any ice of indifference toward me in the pagan's breast, this pleasant, genial smoke we had soon thawed it out, and left us cronies. He seemed to take to me quite as naturally and unbiddenly as I to him, and when our smoke was over he pressed his forehead against mine, clasped me round the waist, and said that henceforth we were married, meaning, in his country's phrase, that we were bosom friends. He would gladly die for me, if the need should be. In a countryman this sudden flame of friendship would have seemed far too premature, a thing to be much distrusted, but in this simple savage those old rules would not apply. After supper and another social chat and smoke we went to our room together. He made me a present of his embalmed head, took out his enormous tobacco wallet, and groping under the tobacco drew out some thirty dollars in silver. Then, spreading them on the table, and mechanically dividing them into two equal portions, pushed one of them toward me, and said it was mine. I was going to remonstrate, but he silenced me by pouring them into my trousers' pockets. I let them stay. He then went about his evening prayers, took out his idol, and removed the paper fireboard. By certain signs and symptoms I thought he seemed anxious for me to join him, but well knowing what was to follow, I deliberated a moment whether, in case he invited me, I would comply or otherwise. I was a good Christian, born and bred in the bosom of the infallible Presbyterian Church. How, then, could I unite with this wild idolater in worshipping his piece of wood? But what is worship, thought I? Do you suppose now, Ishmael, that the magnanimous God of heaven and earth, pagans and all included, can possibly be jealous of an insignificant bit of black wood? Impossible. But what is worship? To do the will of God, that is worship. And what is the will of God? To do to my fellow man what I would have my fellow man do to me, that is the will of God. Now Queequeg is my fellow man. And what do I wish that this Queequeg would do to me? Why, unite with me in my particular Presbyterian form of worship. Consequently, I must then unite with him in his. Ergo, I must turn idolater. So I kindled the shavings, helped prop up the innocent little idol, offered him burnt biscuit with Queequeg, salaamed before him twice or thrice, kissed his nose, and that done, we undressed and went to bed, at peace with our own consciences and all the world. But we did not go to sleep without some little chat. How it is I know not, but there is no place like a bed for confidential disclosures between friends. Man and wife, they say, there open the very bottom of their souls to each other, and some old couples often lie and chat over old times till nearly morning. Thus, then, in our heart's honeymoon, lay I and Queequeg, a cosy, loving pair. CHAPTER Eleven, NIGHTGOWN we had lain thus in bed, chatting and napping at short intervals, 
and Queequeg now and then affectionately throwing his brown tattooed legs over mine, and then drawing them back, so entirely sociable and free and easy were we, when at last, by reason of our confabulations, what little nappishness remained in us altogether departed, and we felt like getting up again, though daybreak was yet some way down the future. Yes, we became very wakeful, so much so that our recumbent position began to grow wearisome, and by little and little we found ourselves sitting up, the clothes well tucked around us, leaning against the headboard with our four knees drawn up close together and our two noses bending over them, as if our knee-pans were warming-pans. We felt very nice and snug, the more so since it was so chilly out of doors, indeed out of bedclothes too, seeing that there was no fire in the room. The more so, I say, because truly to enjoy bodily warmth some small part of you must be cold, for there is no quality in this world that is not what it is merely by contrast. Nothing exists in itself. If you flatter yourself that you are all over comfortable, and have been so for a long time, then you cannot be said to be comfortable any more. But if, like Queequeg and me in the bed, the tip of your nose or the crown of your head be slightly chilled, why then indeed, in the general consciousness, you feel most delightfully and unmistakably warm. For this reason, a sleeping apartment should never be furnished with a fire, which is one of the luxurious discomforts of the rich. For the height of this sort of deliciousness is to have nothing but the blanket between you and your snugness and the cold of the outer air. Then there you lie like the one warm spark in the heart of an arctic crystal. We had been sitting in this crouching manner for some time when all at once I thought I would open my eyes. For when between sheets, whether by day or by night, and whether asleep or awake, I have a way of always keeping my eyes shut, in order the more to concentrate on the snugness of being in bed. Because no man can ever feel his own identity aright except his eyes be closed, as if darkness were indeed the proper element of our essences, though light be more congenial to our clayey part. Upon opening my eyes, then, and coming out of my own pleasant and self-created darkness into the imposed and coarse outer gloom of the unilluminated twelve o'clock at night, I experienced a disagreeable revulsion. Nor did I at all object to the hint from Queequeg that perhaps it were best to strike a light, seeing that we were so wide awake, and besides he felt a strong desire to have a few quiet puffs from his tomahawk. Be it said that though I had felt such a strong repugnance to his smoking in the bed the night before, yet see how elastic our stiff prejudices grow when love comes once to bend them. For now I like nothing better than to have Queequeg smoking by me, even in bed, because he seemed to be full of such serene household joy then. I no more felt unduly concerned for the landlord's policy of insurance. I was only alive to the condensed, confidential comfortableness of sharing a pipe and a blanket with a real friend. With our shaggy jackets drawn about our shoulders, we now passed the tomahawk from one to the other, till slowly there grew over us a blue-hanging tester of smoke, illuminated by the flame of the new-lit lamp. Whether it was that this undulating tester rolled the savage away to far distant scenes, I know not. But he now spoke of his native island, and eager to hear his history, I begged him to go on and tell it. He gladly complied though at the time I but ill comprehended not a few of his words, yet subsequent disclosures, when I had become more familiar with his broken phraseology, now enable me to present the whole story, such as it may prove, in the mere skeleton I give. CHAPTER Twelve, BIOGRAPHICAL Queequeg was a native of Cocovoco, an island far away to the west and south. It is not down in any map, True places never are. When a new-hatched savage, running wild about his native woodlands in a grass-clout, followed by the nibbling goats as if he were a green sapling, even then in Queequeg's ambitious soul lurked a strong desire to see something more of Christendom than a specimen whaler or two. His father was a high chief, a king, his uncle a high priest, and on the maternal side he boasted aunts who were the wives of unconquerable warriors. There was excellent blood in his veins, royal stuff, though sadly vitiated, I fear, by the cannibal propensity he nourished in his untutored youth. 
A Sag Harbor ship visited his father's bay, and Queequeg sought a passage to the Christian lands. But the ship, having her full complement of seamen, spurned his suit, and not all the king his father's influence could prevail. But Queequeg vowed a vow. Alone in his canoe, he paddled off to a distant strait, which he knew the ship must pass through when she quitted the island. On one side was a coral reef, on the other a low tongue of land, covered with mangrove thickets that grew out into the water. Hiding his canoe, still afloat among these thickets, with its prow seaward, he sat down in the stern, paddle low in hand, and when the ship was gliding by, like a flash he darted out, gained her side, and with one backward dash of his foot, capsized and sank the canoe, climbed up the chains, and throwing himself at full length upon the deck, grappled a ring-bolt there, and swore not to let go, though hacked in pieces. In vain the captain threatened to throw him overboard, suspended a cutlass over his naked wrists. Queequeg was the son of a king, and Queequeg budged not. Struck by his desperate dauntlessness, and his wild desire to visit Christendom, the captain at last relented, and told him he might make himself at home. But this fine young savage, this sea prince of Wales, never saw the captain's cabin. They put him down among the sailors, and made a whaleman of him. But like Tsar Peter, content to toil in the shipyards of foreign cities, Queequeg disdained no seeming ignominy, if thereby he might happily gain the power of enlightening his untutored countrymen. For at bottom, so he told me, he was actuated by a profound desire to learn among the Christians the arts whereby to make his people still happier than they were, and more than that, still better than they were. But, alas, the practices of whalemen soon convinced him that even Christians could be both miserable and wicked, infinitely more so than all his father's heathens, arrived at last in old Sag Harbor, and seeing what the sailors did there, and going on to Nantucket, and seeing how they spent their wages in that place also, poor Queequeg gave it up for lost. Thought he, it's a wicked world in all meridians. I'll die a pagan. And thus, an old idolater at heart, he yet lived among these Christians, wore their clothes, and tried to talk their gibberish, hence the queer ways about him, though now some time from home. By hints I asked him whether he did not propose going back, and having a coronation, since he might now consider his father dead and gone, he being very old and feeble at the last accounts. He answered no, not yet, and added that he was fearful Christianity, or rather Christians, had unfitted him for ascending the pure and undefiled throne of thirty pagan kings before him. But by and by, he said, he would return, as soon as he felt himself baptized again. For the nonce, however, he proposed to sail about and sow his wild oats in all four oceans. They had made a harpooner of him, and that barbed iron was in lieu of a scepter now. I asked him what might be his immediate purpose touching his future movements. He answered to go to sea again in his old vocation. Upon this I told him that whaling was my own design, and informed him of my intention to sail out of Nantucket, as being the most promising port for an adventurous whaleman to embark from. He at once resolved to accompany me to that island, ship aboard the same vessel, get into the same watch, the same boat, the same mess with me, in short, to share my every hap, with both my hands in his, boldly dip into the potluck of both worlds. To all this I joyously assented, for besides the affection I now felt for Queequeg, he was an experienced harpooner, and as such could not fail to be of great usefulness to one who, like me, was wholly ignorant of the mysteries of whaling, though well acquainted with the sea, as known to merchant seamen. His story being ended, with his pipe's last dying puff, Queequeg embraced me, pressed his forehead against mine, and blowing out the light, we rolled over from each other this way and that, and very soon were sleeping. End of chapters 10 through 12This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 13 through 15. Chapter 13. Wheelbarrow. 
Next morning, Monday, after disposing of the embalmed head to a barber for a block, I settled my own and comrade's bill, using, however, my comrade's money. The grinning landlord, as well as the boarders, seemed amazingly tickled at the sudden friendship which had sprung up between me and Queequeg, especially as Peter Coffin's cock-and-bull stories about him had previously so much alarmed me concerning the very person whom I now accompanied with. We borrowed a wheelbarrow, and embarking our things, including my own poor carpet-bag and Queequeg's canvas sack and hammock, away went down to the moss, a little Nantucket packet schooner moored at the wharf. As we were going along, the people stared, not at Queequeg so much, for they were used to seeing cannibals like him in their streets, but at seeing him and me on such confidential terms. But we heeded them not, going along wheeling the barrow by turns, and Queequeg now and then stopping to adjust the sheath on his harpoon barbs. I asked him why he carried such a troublesome thing with him ashore, and whether all whaling ships did not find their own harpoons. To this, in substance, he replied that, though what I hinted was true enough, yet he had a particular affection for his own harpoon, because it was of assured stuff, well tried in many a mortal combat, and deeply intimate with the hearts of whales. In short, like many inland reapers and mowers, who go into the farmer's meadows armed with their own scythes, though in no wise obliged to furnish them, even so Queequeg, for his own private reasons, preferred his own harpoon. Shifting the barrow from my hand to his, he told me a funny story about the first wheelbarrow he had ever seen. It was in Sag Harbor. The owners of his ship, it seems, had lent him one, in which to carry his heavy chest to his boarding-house. Not to seem ignorant about the thing, though in truth he was entirely so, concerning the precise way in which to manage the barrow, Queequeg put his chest upon it, lashes it fast, and then shoulders the barrow and marches up the wharf. Why, said I, Queequeg, you might have known better than that, one would think. Didn't the people laugh? Upon this he told me another story. The people of his island of Cocovoco, it seems, at their wedding feasts, express the fragrant water of young coconuts into a large stained calabash, like a punch-bowl, and this punch-bowl always forms the great central ornament on the braided mat where the feast is held. Now a certain grand merchant ship once touched at Cocovoco, and its commander, uh, from all accounts a very stately punctilious gentleman, at least for a sea captain, this commander was invited to the wedding feast of Queequeg's sister, a pretty young princess just turned of ten. Well, when all the wedding guests were assembled at the bride's bamboo cottage, this captain marches in, and being assigned the post of honor, placed himself over against the punch-bowl, and between the high priest and his majesty the king, Queequeg's father. Grace being said, for those people have grace as well as we, though Queequeg told me that unlike us, who at such times look downward to our platters, they, on the contrary, copying the ducks, glance upward to the great giver of all feasts. Grace, I say, being said, the high priest opens the banquet by the immemorial ceremony of the island, that is, dipping his consecrated and consecrating fingers into the bowl before the blessed beverage circulates. Seeing himself placed next to the priest, and noting the ceremony, and thinking himself, being captain of a ship, as having plain precedence over a mere island king, especially in the king's own house, the captain coolly proceeds to wash his hands in the punch-bowl, taking it, I suppose, for a huge finger-glass. Now, said Queequeg, what do you think now? Didn't our people laugh? At last, passage paid and luggage safe, we stood on board the schooner. Hoisting sail, it glided down the Akushnet River. On one side, New Bedford rose in terraces of streets, their ice-covered trees all glittering in the clear, cold air. Huge hills and mountains of casks on casks were piled upon her wharves, and side by side the world-wandering whale-ships lay silent and safely moored at last, while from others came a sound of carpenters and coopers, with blended noises of fires and forges to melt the pitch, all betokening that new cruises were on the start, that one most perilous and long voyage ended only begins a second, and a second ended only begins a third, and so on, forever and for aye. 
such is the endlessness, yea, the intolerableness of all earthly effort. Gaining the more open water, the bracing breeze waxed fresh. The little moss tossed the quick foam from her bows as a young colt his snortings. How I snuffed that tartar air! How I spurned that turnpike earth, that common highway all over dented with the marks of slavish heels and hoofs, and turned me to admire the magnanimity of the sea which will permit no records. At the same foam fountain, Queequeg seemed to drink and reel with me. His dusky nostrils swelled apart, he showed his filed and pointed teeth. On, on we flew, and, our offing gained, the moss did homage to the blast, ducked and dived her bows as a slave before the sultan. Sideways leaning, we sideways darted, every rope-yarn tingling like a wire, the two tall masts buckling like Indian canes in land tornadoes. So full of this reeling scene were we, as we stood by the plunging bowsprit, that for some time we did not notice the jeering glances of the passengers, a lubber-like assembly, who marveled that two fellow-beings should be so companionable, as though a white man were anything more dignified than a whitewashed negro. But there were some boobies and bumpkins there, who, by their intense greenness, must have come from the heart and centre of all verdure. Queequeg caught one of these young saplings, mimicking him behind his back. I thought the bumpkin's hour of doom was come. Dropping his harpoon, the brawny savage caught him in his arms, and by an almost miraculous dexterity and strength sent him high up bodily into the air. Then, slightly tapping his stern in mid-somerset, the fellow landed with bursting lungs upon his feet, while Queequeg, turning his back upon him, lighted his tomahawk pipe and passed it to me for a puff. "'Capting! Capting!' yelled the bumpkin, running towards that officer. "'Capting! Capting! Here's the devil!' "'Hello, you, sir!' cried the captain, a gaunt rib of the sea, stalking up to Queequeg. "'What in thunder do you mean by that? Don't you know you might have killed that chap?' "'What him say?' said Queequeg, as he mildly turned to me. "'He say,' said I, "'that you came near Killy that man there.' pointing to the still shivering greenhorn. "'Killy!' <laughs> cried Queequeg, twisting his tattooed face into an unearthly expression of disdain. "'Ah! Him bevy small fishy! Queequeg no killy so smally fishy! Queequeg killy big whale!' "'Look you!' roared the captain. "'I'll killy you, you cannibal, if you try any more of your tricks aboard here, so mind your eye!' But it so happened just then that it was high time for the captain to mind his own eye. The prodigious strain upon the mainsail had parted the weather-sheet, and the tremendous boom was now flying from side to side, completely sweeping the entire after-part of the deck. The poor fellow whom Queequeg had handled so roughly was swept overboard. All hands were in a panic, and to attempt snatching at the boom to stay it seemed madness. It flew from right to left and back again, almost in one ticking of a watch, and every instant seemed on the point of snapping into splinters. Nothing was done, and nothing seemed capable of being done. Those on deck rushed toward the bows and stood eyeing the boom as if it were the lower jaw of an exasperated whale. In the midst of this consternation, Queequeg dropped deftly to his knees, and crawling under the path of the boom, whipped hold of a rope, secured one end to the bulwarks, and then flinging the other like a lasso, caught it round the boom as it swept over his head, and at the next jerk the spar was that way trapped and all was safe. The schooner was run into the wind, and while the hands were clearing away the stern-boat, Queequeg, stripped to the waist, darted from the side with a long living arc of a leap. For three minutes or more he was seen swimming like a dog, throwing his long arms straight out before him, and by turns revealing his brawny shoulders through the freezing foam. I looked at the grand and glorious fellow, but saw no one to be saved. The greenhorn had gone down. Shooting himself perpendicularly from the water, Queequeg now took an instant's glance around him, and seeming to see just how matters were, dived down and disappeared. A few minutes more, and he rose again, one arm still striking out, and with the other dragging a lifeless form. The boat soon picked them up. The poor bumpkin was restored. All hands voted Queequeg a noble trump. The captain begged his pardon. From that hour, I clove to Queequeg like a barnacle. 
yea, till poor Queequeg took his last long dive. Was there ever such unconsciousness? He did not seem to think that he had all deserved a medal from the humane and magnanimous societies. He only asked for water, fresh water, something to wipe the brine off. That done, he put on dry clothes, lighted his pipe, and leaning against the bulwarks and mildly eyeing those around him, seemed to be saying to himself, It's a mutual joint-stock world in all meridians. We cannibals must help these Christians. Chapter 14 Nantucket Nothing more happened on the passage worthy of mentioning, so after a fine run we safely arrived in Nantucket. Nantucket! Take out your map and look at it. See what a real corner of the world it occupies, how it stands there, away off shore, more lonely than the Eddystone lighthouse. Look at it, a mere hillock and elbow of sand, all beach and without a background. There is more sand there than you would use in twenty years as a substitute for blotting paper. Some gamesome whites will tell you that they have to plant weeds there, that they don't grow naturally, that they import Canada thistles, that they have to send beyond seas for a spile to stop a leak in an oil cask, that pieces of wood in Nantucket are carried about like bits of the true cross in Rome, that people there plant toadstools before their house to get under the shade in summer time, that one blade of grass makes an oasis, three blades in a day's walk a prairie, that they wear quicksand shoes, something like Laplander snowshoes, that they are so shut up, belted about, every way enclosed, surrounded, and made an utter island of by the ocean, that to their very chairs and tables small clams will sometimes be found adhering, as to the backs of sea turtles. But these extravaganzas only show that Nantucket is no Illinois. Look now at the wondrous traditional story of how this island was settled by the red men. Thus goes the legend. In olden times an eagle swooped down upon the New England coast and carried off an infant Indian in its talons. With loud laments the parents saw their child borne out of sight over the wide waters. They resolved to follow in the same direction. Setting out in their canoes, after a perilous passage, they discovered the island, and there they found an empty ivory casket, the poor little Indian's skeleton. What wonder, then, that these Nantucketers, born on a beach, should take to the sea for a livelihood? They first caught crabs and quahogs in the sand. Grown bolder, they waded out with nets for mackerel. More experienced, they pushed off in boats and captured cod, and at last, launching a navy of great ships on the sea, explored this watery world, put an incessant belt of circumnavigations round it, peeped in at Bering Straits, and in all seasons and all oceans declared everlasting war with the mightiest animated mass that has survived the flood, most monstrous and most mountainous, that Himalayan salt sea mastodon, clothed with such portentousness of unconscious power that his very panics are more to be dreaded than his most fearless and malicious assaults. And thus of these naked Nantucketers, these sea hermits, issuing from their ant hill in the sea, overrun and conquered the watery world like so many Alexanders, parceling out among them the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian oceans, as the three pirate powers did Poland. Let America add Mexico to Texas and pile Cuba upon Canada. Let the English overswarm all India and hang out their blazing banner from the sun. Two-thirds of this terraqueous globe are the Nantucketers. For the sea is his. He owns it, as emperors own empires, other seamen having but a right of way through it. Merchant ships are but extension bridges, armed ones but floating forts. Even pirates and privateers, though following the sea as highwaymen the road, they but plunder other ships, other fragments of the land like themselves, without seeking to draw their living from the bottomless deep itself. The Nantucketer, he alone resides and riots on the sea. He alone, in Bible language, goes down to it in ships, to and fro ploughing it as his own special plantation. There is his home, there lies his business, which a Noah's flood would not interrupt, though it overwhelmed all the millions in China. He lives on the sea as prairie cocks in the prairie. He hides among the waves. He climbs them as chamois hunters climb the Alps. 
For years he knows not the land, so that when he comes to it at last, it smells like another world, more strangely than the moon would to an earthman. With the landless gull that at sunset folds her wings and is rocked to sleep between billows, so at nightfall the Nantucketer, out of sight of land, furls his sails and lays him to his rest, while under his very pillow rush herds of walruses and whales. Chapter 15. Chowder. It was quite late in the evening when the little moss came snugly to anchor, and Queequeg and I went ashore, so we could attend to no business that day, at least none but a supper and a bed. The landlord of the Spouter Inn had recommended us to his cousin, Hosea Hussey, of the Tripots, whom he asserted to be the proprietor of one of the best-kept hotels in all Nantucket. And, moreover, he had assured us— that cousin Hosea, as he called him, was famous for his chowders. In short, he plainly hinted that we could not possibly do better than try potluck at the tripots. But the directions he had given us about keeping a yellow warehouse on our starboard hand till we opened a white church to the larboard, and then keeping that on the larboard hand till we made a corner three points to the starboard, and that done, then asked the first man we met where the place was, these crooked directions of his very much puzzled us at first, especially as at the outset Queequeg insisted that the yellow warehouse, our first point of departure, must be left on the larboard hand, whereas I had understood Peter Coffin to say it was on the starboard. However, by dint of beating about a little in the dark, and now and then knocking up a peaceable inhabitant to inquire the way, we at last came to something which there was no mistaking— Two enormous wooden pots, painted black, and suspended by asses' ears, swung from the cross-trees of an old topmast, planted in front of an old doorway. The horns of the cross-trees were sawed off on the other side, so that this old topmast looked not a little like the gallows. Perhaps I was oversensitive to such impressions at the time, but I could not help staring at this gallows with vague misgiving. A sort of crick was in my neck as I gazed up to the two remaining horns. Yes, two of them, one for Queequeg and one for me. It's ominous, thinks I. A coffin, my innkeeper, upon landing in my first whaling port, tombstone staring at me in the whaleman's chapel, and here a gallows, and a pair of prodigious black pots, too. Are these last throwing out oblique hints touching Tophet? I was called from these reflections by the sight of a freckled woman with yellow hair and a yellow gown, standing in the porch of the inn under a dull red lamp swinging there, that looked much like an injured eye, and carrying on a brisk scolding with a man in a purple woolen shirt. "'Get along with ye,' she said to the man, "'or I'll be combing ye.' "'Come on, Queequeg,' said I. "'All right, there's Mrs. Hussey.' And so it turned out, Mr. Hosea Hussey being from home, but leaving Mrs. Hussey entirely competent to attend to all his affairs. Upon making known our desires for supper and a bed, Mrs. Hussey, postponing further scolding for the present, ushered us into a little room, and seating us at a table spread with the relics of a recently concluded repast, turned round to us and said, "'Clam or cod?' "'What's that about cods, ma'am?' said I, with much politeness. "'Clam or cod?' she repeated. "'A clam for supper. A cold clam. Is that what you mean, Mrs. Hussey?' says I. "'But that's a rather cold and clammy reception in the winter time, ain't it, Mrs. Hussey?' But being in a great hurry to resume scolding the man in the purple shirt, who was waiting for it in the entry, and seeming to hear nothing but the word clam, Mrs. Hussey hurried towards an open door leading to the kitchen, and bawling out, "'Clam for two! disappeared. "'Queequeg,' said I, "'do you think that we can make out a supper for us both on one clam?' However, a warm and savoury steam from the kitchen served to belie the apparently cheerless prospect before us. But when that smoking chowder came in, the mystery was delightfully explained. "'Oh, sweet friends, hearken to me!' It was made of small, juicy clams, scarcely bigger than hazelnuts, mixed with pounded ship biscuit, and salted pork cut up into little flakes, the whole enriched with butter and plentifully seasoned with pepper and salt. 
our appetites being sharpened by the frosty voyage, and in particular Queequeg seeing his favorite fishing food before him, and the chowder being surpassingly excellent, we dispatched it with great expedition. When, leaning back a moment, and bethinking me of Mrs. Hussey's clam and cod announcement, I thought I would try a little experiment. Stepping to the kitchen door, I uttered the word, COD, with great emphasis, and resumed my seat. In a few moments, the savory steam came forth again, but with a different flavor, and in good time a fine cod chowder was placed before us. We resumed business, and, while plying our spoons in the bowl, thinks I to myself, I wonder now if this here has any effect on the head. What's that stultifying saying about chowder-headed people? But look, Queequeg, ain't that a live eel in your bowl? Where's your harpoon? Fishiest of all fishy places was the tripots, which well deserved its name, for the pots there were always boiling chowders, chowder for breakfast, and chowder for dinner, and chowder for supper, till you began to look for fish bones coming through your clothes. The area before the house was paved with clam shells. Mrs. Hussey wore a polished necklace of codfish vertebrae, and Hosea Hussey had his account books bound in superior old shark skin. There was a fishy flavor to the milk, too, which I could not at all account for, till one morning, happening to take a stroll along the beach, among some fishermen's boats, I saw Hosea's brindled cow feeding on fish remnants, and marching along the sand with each foot in a cod's decapitated head, looking very slipshod, I assure you. Supper concluded, we received a lamp, and directions from Mrs. Hussey concerning the nearest way to bed. But as Queequeg was about to precede me up the stairs, the lady reached forth her arm, and demanded his harpoon. She allowed no harpoon in her chambers. "'Why not?' said I. "'Every true whaleman sleeps with his harpoon. But why not?' "'Because it's dangerous,' says she. "'Ever since young Stiggs, coming from that unfortunate voyage of his, when he was gone four years and a half, with only three barrels of ile, was found dead in my first floor back with his harpoon in his side. Ever since then I allow no boarders to take sich dangerous weapons in their rooms at night. So, Mr. Queequeg, for she had learned his name, I will just take this here iron and keep it for you till morning. But the chowder, clam or cod to-morrow for breakfast, men? Both, says I, and let's have a couple of smoked herring by way of variety. End of chapters 13 through 15This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville Chapter 16 The Ship In bed we concocted our plans for the morrow, but to my surprise, and no small concern, Queequeg now gave me to understand that he had been diligently consulting Yojo, the name of his black little god, and Yojo had told him two or three times over, and strongly insisted upon it every way, that instead of our going together among the whaling fleet in the harbor, and in concert selecting our craft, instead of this, I say, Yojo earnestly enjoined that the selection of the ship should rest wholly with me, inasmuch as Yojo proposed befriending us, and, in order to do so, had already pitched upon a vessel, which, if left to myself, I, Ishmael, should infallibly light upon, for all the world as though it had turned out by chance, and in that vessel I must immediately ship myself, for the present irrespective of Queequeg. I have forgotten to mention that in many things Queequeg placed great confidence in the excellence of Yojo's judgment and surprising forecast of things, and cherished Yojo with considerable esteem, as a rather good sort of god who perhaps meant well enough upon the whole, but in all cases did not succeed in his benevolent designs. Now this plan of Queequeg's, or rather Yojo's, touching the selection of our craft, I did not like that plan at all. I had not a little relied upon Queequeg's sagacity to point out the whaler best fitted to carry us and our fortunes securely. But as all my remonstrances produced no effect upon Queequeg, I was obliged to acquiesce, 
and accordingly prepared to set about this business with a determined rushing sort of energy and vigour that should quickly settle that trifling little affair. Next morning, early, leaving Queequeg shut up with Yojo in our little bedroom, for it seemed that it was some sort of Lent or Ramadan or day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer with Queequeg and Yojo that day. How it was I never could find out, for though I applied myself to it several times I never could master his liturgies and thirty-nine articles. Leaving Queequeg then, fasting on his tomahawk pipe, and Yojo warming himself at his sacrificial fire of shavings, I sallied out among the shipping. After much prolonged sauntering and many random inquiries, I learnt that there were three ships up for three years' voyages, the Devil Dam, the Titbit, and the Pequod. Devil Dam I do not know the origin of, Titbit is obvious, Pequod, you will no doubt remember, was the name of a celebrated tribe of Massachusetts Indians, now extinct as the ancient Medes. I peered and pried about the Devil Dam, from her hopped over to the titbit, and finally going on board the Pequod, looked around her for a moment, and then decided that this was the very ship for us. You may have seen many a quaint craft in your day, for aught I know, square-toed luggers, mountainous Japanese junks, butter-box galliots, and what not, but take my word for it, you never saw such a rare old craft as this same rare old Pequod, she was a ship of the old school, rather small, if anything, with an old-fashioned, claw-footed look about her, long-seasoned and weather-stained in typhoons and calms of all four oceans. Her old hull's complexion was darkened like a French grenadier's, who has alike fought in Egypt and Siberia. Her venerable bows looked bearded. Her masts, cut somewhere on the coasts of Japan, where her original ones were lost overboard in a gale, her masts stood stiffly up like the spines of the three old kings of Cologne. Her ancient decks were worn and wrinkled like the pilgrim-worshipped flagstone in Canterbury Cathedral where Becket bled. But to all these, her old antiquities, were added new and marvellous features, pertaining to the wild business that for more than half a century she had followed. Old Captain Peleg, many years her chief mate, before he commanded another vessel of his own, and now a retired seaman and one of the principal owners of the Pequod, this old Peleg, during the term of his chief mateship, had built upon her original grotesqueness and inlaid it all over, with a quaintness both of material and device, unmatched by anything except it be Thorkill Hake's carved buckler or bedstead. She was apparelled like any barbaric Ethiopian emperor, his neck heavy with pendants of polished ivory. She was a thing of trophies, a cannibal of a craft, tricking herself forth in the chaste bones of her enemies. All round her unpanelled open bulwarks were garnished like one continuous jaw, with the long sharp teeth of the sperm whale inserted there for pins to fasten her old hempen thews and tendons to. Those thews ran not through base blocks of land wood, but deftly travelled over sheaves of sea ivory. Scorning a turnstile wheel at her reverend helm, she sported there a tiller, and that tiller was in one mass, curiously carved from the long narrow lower jaw of her hereditary foe, the helmsman who steered by that tiller in a tempest felt like the tartar when he holds back his fiery steed by clutching its jaw. A noble craft, but somehow a most melancholy. All noble things are touched with that. Now when I looked about the quarter-deck for someone having authority in order to propose myself as a candidate for the voyage, at first I saw nobody but I could not well overlook a strange sort of tent, or rather wigwam, pitched a little behind the mainmast. It seemed only a temporary erection used in port. It was of a conical shape, some ten feet high, consisting of the long, huge slabs of limber black bone taken from the middle and highest part of the jaws of the right whale. Planted with their broad ends on the deck, a circle of these slabs, laced together, mutually sloped towards each other, 
and at the apex united in a tufted point where the loose hairy fibres waved to and fro like the topknot on some old Potawatomi sachem's head. A triangular opening faced towards the bows of the ship, so that the insider commanded a complete view forward. And half concealed in this queer tenement I at length found one who, by his aspect, seemed to have authority, and who, it being noon, and the ship's work suspended, was now enjoying respite from the burden of command. He was seated on an old-fashioned oaken chair, wriggling all over with curious carving, and the bottom of which was formed of a stout interlacing of the same elastic stuff of which the wigwam was constructed. There was nothing so very particular, perhaps, about the appearance of the elderly man I saw. He was brown and brawny, like most old seamen, and heavily rolled up in blue pilot-cloth, cut in the Quaker style. Only there was a fine and almost microscopic network of the minutest wrinkles interlacing round his eyes, which must have arisen from his continual sailings and many hard gales, and always looking to windward, for this causes the muscles about the eyes to become pursed together. Such eye-wrinkles are very effectual in a scowl. "'Is this the captain of the Pequod?' said I, advancing to the door of the tent. "'Supposing it be the captain of the Pequod, what dost thou want of him?' he demanded. "'I was thinking of shipping.' "'Thou wast, wast thou. I see thou art no Nantucketer. Ever been in a stove-boat?' "'No, sir, I never have.' "'Dost know nothing at all about whaling, I dare say, eh?' "'Nothing, sir, but I have no doubt I soon shall learn. I've been several voyages in the merchant service, and I think that merchant service be damned. Talk not that lingo to me. Dost see that leg? I'll take that leg away from thy stern, if ever thou talkest of the merchant service to me again. Merchant service, indeed. I suppose now ye feel considerable proud of having served in those merchant ships. But flukes, man, what makes thee want to go a-whaling, eh? It looks a little suspicious, don't it, eh? Hast not been a pirate, hast thou? Didst not rob thy last captain, didst thou? Didst not think of murdering the officers when thou gettest to sea? I protested my innocence of these things. I saw that under the mask of these half-humorous innuendos, this old seaman, as an insulated Quakerish Nantucketer, was full of his insular prejudices, and rather distrustful of all aliens unless they hailed from Cape Cod or the vineyard. "'But what takes thee a-wailing? I want to know that before I think of shipping ye.' "'Well, sir, I want to see what whaling is. I want to see the world.' "'Want to see what whaling is, eh? Have ye clapped an eye on Captain Ahab?' "'Who is Captain Ahab, sir?' "'Aye, aye, I thought so. Captain Ahab is the captain of this ship.' I am mistaken, then. I thought I was speaking to the captain himself. Thou art speaking to Captain Peleg. That's who ye are speaking to, young man. It belongs to me and Captain Bildad to see the Pequod fitted out for the voyage and supplied with all her needs, including crew. We are part owners and agents. But as I was going to say, if thou wantest to know what whaling is, as thou tellest ye do, I can put ye in the way of finding it out before ye bind yourself to it, past backing out. Clap eye on Captain Ahab, young man, and thou wilt find that he has only one leg. What do you mean, sir? Was the other lost by a whale? Lost by a whale? Young man, come nearer to me. It was devoured, chewed up, crunched by the monstrousest parmacetti that ever chipped a boat. Ah, ah. I was a little alarmed by his energy, perhaps also a little touched at the hearty grief in his concluding exclamation, but said as calmly as I could, What you say is no doubt true enough, sir, but how could I know there was any peculiar ferocity in that particular whale, though indeed I might have inferred as much from the simple fact of the accident? Now look ye, young man, Thy lungs are a sort of a soft, do you see? Thou dost not talk shark a bit. Sure you've been to sea before now. Sure of that. Sir, said I, I thought I told you that I had been four voyages in the merchant— Hard down on that! 
Mind what I said about the merchant service. Don't aggravate me. I won't have it. But let us understand each other. I have given thee a hint about what whaling is. Do you yet feel inclined for it? I do, sir. Very good. Now art thou the man to pitch a harpoon down a live whale's throat, and then jump after it? Answer quick. I am, sir, if it should be positively indispensable to do so, not to be got rid of, that is, which I don't take to be the fact. Good again. Now then, thou not only wantest to go whaling to find out by experience what whaling is, but ye also want to go in order to see the world. Was that not what ye said? I thought so. Well then, just step forward there and take a peep over the weather bow, and then back to me and tell me what ye see there. For a moment I stood a little puzzled by this curious request, not knowing exactly how to take it, whether humorously or in earnest. But concentrating all his crow's feet into one scowl, Captain Peleg started me on the errand. Going forward and glancing over the weather bow, I perceived that the ship swinging to her anchor with the flood tide was now obliquely pointing towards the open ocean. The prospect was unlimited, but exceedingly monotonous and forbidding not the slightest variety that I could see. "'Well, what's the report?' said Peleg, when I came back. "'What did you see?' "'Not much,' I replied. "'Nothing but water. Considerable horizon, though, and there's a squall coming up, I think. "'Well, what dost thou think, then, of seeing the world? Do you wish to go round Cape Horn to see any more of it, eh? Can't you see the world where you stand?' I was a little staggered, but go a whaling I must, and I would, and the Pequod was as good a ship as any, I thought the best, and all this I now repeated to Peleg. Seeing me so determined, he expressed his willingness to ship me. "'And thou mayest as well sign the papers right off,' he added. "'Come along with ye,' and so saying he led the way below deck into the cabin." Seated on the transom was what seemed to me a most uncommon and surprising figure. It turned out to be Captain Bildad, who, along with Captain Peleg, was one of the largest owners of the vessel, the other shares, as is sometimes the case in these ports, being held by a crowd of old annuitants, widows, fatherless children, and chancery wards, each owning about the value of a timber-head or a foot of plank or a nail or two in the ship, People in Nantucket invest their money in whaling vessels the same way that you do yours in approved state stocks bringing in good interest. Now Bildad, like Peleg, and indeed many other Nantucketers, was a Quaker, the island having been originally settled by that sect. And to this day its inhabitants, in general, retain in an uncommon measure the peculiarities of the Quaker only variously and anomalously modified by things altogether alien and heterogeneous. For some of these same Quakers are the most sanguinary of all sailors and whale-hunters. They are fighting Quakers. They are Quakers with a vengeance. So that there are instances among them of men who, named with scripture names, a singularly common fashion on the island, and in childhood naturally imbibing the stately dr dramatic thee and thou of the Quaker idiom, still from the audacious daring and boundless adventure of their subsequent lives, strangely blend with these unoutgrown pe peculiarities a thousand bold dashes of character not unworthy of a Scandinavian sea-king or a poetical pagan Roman. And when these things unite in a man of greatly superior natural force, with a globular brain and a ponderous heart, who has also by the stillness and seclusion of many long night watches in the remotest waters, and beneath constellations never seen here at the north, been led to think untraditionally and independently, receiving all nature's sweet or savage impressions fresh from her own virgin, voluntary, and confiding breast, and thereby chiefly, but with some help from accidental advantages, to learn a bold and nervous lofty language, that man makes one in a whole nation census, a mighty pageant creature formed for noble tragedies. 
nor will it at all detract from him, dramatically regarded, if either by birth or other circumstances, he have what seems a half-wilful overruling morbidness at the bottom of his nature. For all men tragically great are made so through a certain morbidness. Be sure of this, O young ambition, all mortal greatness is but disease. But as yet we have not to do with such a one, but with quite another, and still a man who, if indeed peculiar, it only results again from another phase of the Quaker, modified by individual circumstances. Like Captain Peleg, Captain Bildad was a well-to-do, retired whaleman. But unlike Captain Peleg, who cared not a rush for what are called serious things, and indeed deemed those self-same serious things the veriest of all trifles, Captain Bildad had not only been originally educated according to the strictest sect of Nantucket Quakerism, but all his subsequent ocean life, and the sight of many unclad lovely island creatures round the horn, all that had not moved this native-born Quaker one single jot, had not so much as altered one angle of his vest. Still, for all this immutableness, there was some lack of common consistency about the worthy Captain Bildad. Though refusing from conscientious scruples to bear arms against land invaders, yet himself had illimitably invaded the Atlantic and Pacific, and, though a sworn foe to human bloodshed, yet had he, in his straight-bodied coat, spilled tons upon tons of leviathan gore. How now, in the contemplative evening of his days, the pious Bildad reconciled these things in his reminiscence, I do not know, but it did not seem to concern him much, and very probably he had long since come to the sage and sensible conclusion that a man's religion is one thing, and this practical world quite another. This world pays dividends. Rising from a little cabin boy in short clothes of the drabbest drab to a harpooner in the broad shad-bellied waistcoat, from that becoming boat-header, chief mate, and captain, and finally a ship-owner, Bildad, as I hinted before, had concluded his adventurous career by wholly retiring from active life at the goodly age of sixty, and dedicating his remaining days to the quiet receiving of his well-earned income. Now Bildad, I am sorry to say, had the reputation of being an incorrigible old hunks, and in his sea-going days a bitter, hard taskmaster. They told me in Nantucket, though it certainly seems a curious story, that when he sailed the old Cattegut whaleman, his crew, upon arriving home, were mostly all carried ashore to the hospital, sore exhausted and worn out. For a pious man, especially for a Quaker, he was certainly rather hard-hearted, to say the least. He never used to swear, though, at his men, they said. But somehow he got an inordinate quantity of cruel, unmitigated hard work out of them. When Bildad was a chief mate, to have his drab-coloured eye intently looking at you made you feel completely nervous, till you could clutch something, a hammer or a marling spike, and go to work like mad at something or other, never mind what. Indolence and idleness perished before him. His own person was the exact embodiment of his utilitarian character. On his long, gaunt body he carried no spare flesh, no superfluous beard, his chin having a soft, economical nap to it, like the worn nap of his broad-brimmed hat. Such, then, was the person that I saw seated on the transom when I followed Captain Peleg down into the cabin. The space between the decks was small, and there, bolt upright, sat old Bildad, who always sat so, and never leaned, and this to save his coat-tails. His broad brim was placed beside him, his legs were stiffly crossed, his drab vesture was buttoned up to his chin, and spectacles on nose he seemed absorbed in reading from a ponderous volume. "'Bildad!' cried Captain Peleg. "'At it again, Bildad, eh?' You have been studying those scriptures now for the last thirty years, to my certain knowledge. How far you get, Bildad? As if long habituated to such profane talk from his old shipmate, Bildad, without noticing his present irreverence, quietly looked up, and seeing me, glanced again inquiringly towards Peleg. He says he's our man, Bildad, said Peleg. He wants to ship. Dost thee, said Bildad in a hollow tone and turning round to me. "'I dust,' 
said I unconsciously, he was so intense a Quaker. "'What do you think of him, Bildad?' said Peleg. "'He'll do,' said Bildad, eyeing me, and then went on spelling away at his book in a mumbling tone quite audible. I thought him the queerest old Quaker I ever saw, especially as Peleg, his friend and old shipmate, seemed such a blusterer. But I said nothing, only looking round me sharply. Peleg now threw open a chest, and drawing forth the ship's articles, placed pen and ink before him, and seated himself at a little table. I began to think it was high time to settle with myself at what terms I would be willing to engage for the voyage. I was already aware that in the whaling business they paid no wages, but all hands, including the captain, received certain shares of the profit, called lays, and that these lays were proportioned to the degree of importance pertaining to the respective duties of the ship's company. I was also aware that being a green hand at whaling, my own lay could not be very large, but considering that I was used to the sea, could steer a ship, splice a rope, and all that, I made no doubt that from all I had heard I should be offered at least the 275th lay, that is, the 275th part of the clear net proceeds of the voyage, whatever that might eventually amount to. And though the 275th lay was what they call a rather long lay, yet it was better than nothing, and if we had a lucky voyage might pretty nearly pay for the clothing I would wear out on it, not to speak of my three years' beef and board, for which I would not have to pay one stiver. It might be thought that this was a very poor way to accumulate a princely fortune, and so it was, a very poor way indeed. But I am one of those that never take on about princely fortunes, and am quite content if the world is ready to board and lodge me, while I am putting up at this grim sign of the thundercloud. Upon the whole, I thought that the 275th lay would be about the fair thing, but I would not have been surprised if I had been offered the 200th, considering I was of a broad-shouldered make. But one thing, nevertheless, that made me a little distrustful about receiving a generous share of the profits was this. Ashore I had heard something of both Captain Peleg and his unaccountable old crony Bildad, how that they, being the principal proprietors of the Pequod, Therefore the other and more inconsiderable scattered owners left nearly the whole management of the ship's affairs to these two, and I did not know but what the stingy old Bildad might have a mighty deal to say about shipping hands, especially as I now found him on board the Pequod, quite at home there in the cabin, and reading his Bible as if at his own fireside. Now, while Peleg was vainly trying to mend a pen with his jackknife, Old Bildad, to my no small surprise, considering that he was such an interested party in these proceedings, Bildad never heeded us, but went on mumbling to himself out of his book, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where mo— Well, Captain Bildad, interrupted Peleg, what do you say? What lay shall we give this young man? Thou knowest best, was the sepulchral reply. The seven hundred and seventy-seventh wouldn't be too much, would it? Where moth and rust do corrupt, but lay— Lay, indeed, thought I, and such a lay! The seven hundred and seventy-seventh? Well, old Bildad, you are determined that I, for one, shall not lay up many lays here below, where moth and rust do corrupt. It was an exceedingly long lay, that indeed— and though from the magnitude of the figure it might at first deceive the landsman, yet the slightest consideration will show that though 777 is a pretty large number, yet when you come to make a tenth of it, you will see, as I say, that the 777th part of a farthing is a good deal less than 777 gold doubloons, and so thought I at the time. "'I blast your eyes, Bildad!' cried Peleg. Thou dost not want to swindle this young man. He must have more than that. Seven hundred and seventy-seventh, again said Bildad, without lifting his eyes, and then went on mumbling, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I am going to put him down for the three hundredth, said Peleg. Do you hear that, Bildad? The three hundredth lay, I say. Bildad lay down his book, and turning solemnly towards him, said, "'Captain Peleg, thou hast a generous heart, 
but thou must consider the duty thou owest to the other owners of this ship, widows and orphans, many of them, and that if we too abundantly reward the labours of this young man, we may be taking bread from those widows and those orphans. The seven hundred and seventy-seventh lay, Captain Peleg. "'Thou Bildad!' roared Peleg, starting up and clattering about the cabin. "'Blast ye, Captain Bildad, if I had followed thy advice in these matters, I would afore now had a conscience to lug about, and would be heavy enough to founder the largest ship that ever sailed round Cape Horn.' "'Captain Peleg,' said Bildad steadily, "'thy conscience may be drawing ten inches of water, or ten fathoms, I can't tell.' But as thou art still an impenitent man, Captain Peleg, I greatly fear, lest thy conscience be but a leaky one, and will in the end sink thee foundering down to the fiery pit, Captain Peleg. Fiery pit! Fiery pit! Ye insult me, man! Past all natural bearing ye insult me! It's an all-fired outrage to tell any human creature that he's bound to hell! Flukes and flames, Bildad! Say that again to me, and start my soul bolts, I'll, I'll, yes, I'll swallow a live goat with all his hair and horns on. Out of the cabin, ye canting, drab-colored son of a wooden gun. A straight wake with ye. As he thundered out this, he made a rush at Bildad, but with a marvelous oblique sliding celerity, Bildad for that time eluded him. Alarmed at this terrible outburst between the two principal and responsible owners of the ship, and feeling half a mind to give up all idea of sailing in a vessel so questionably owned and temporarily commanded, I stepped aside from the door to give egress to Bildad, who, I made no doubt, was all eagerness to vanish before the awakened wrath of Peleg. But to my astonishment he sat down again on the transom very quietly, and seemed to have not the slightest intention of withdrawing. He seemed quite used to the impenitent Peleg and his ways. As for Peleg, after letting off his rage as he had, there seemed no more left in him, and he too sat down like a lamb, though he twitched a little as if still nervously agitated. Whew! he whistled at last. A squall's gone off to leeward, I think. Bildad, thou used to be good at sharpening a lance. Mend that pen, will you? My jackknife here needs the grindstone. That's he, thank you, Bildad. Now then, my young man, Ishmael's thy name, didn't you say? Well then, down you go here, Ishmael, for the three hundredth lay. Captain Peleg, said I, I have a friend with me who wants to ship too. Shall I bring him down tomorrow? To be sure, said Peleg. Fetch him along, and we'll look at him. What lay does he want? groaned Bildad glancing up from the book in which he had again been burying himself. "'Ah, never mind about that, Bildad,' said Peleg. "'Has he ever wailed at any?' turning to me. "'Killed more whales than I can count, Captain Peleg. "'Well, bring him along, then.' And after signing the papers, off I went, nothing doubting but that I had done a good morning's work, and that the Pequod was the identical ship that Yojo had provided to carry Queequeg and me round the Cape. But I had not proceeded far when I began to bethink me that the captain with whom I was to sail yet remained unseen by me, though indeed in many cases a whale-ship will be completely fitted out, and receive all her crew on board ere the captain makes himself visible by arriving to take command, for sometimes these voyages are so prolonged and the shore intervals at home so exceedingly brief that if the captain have a family or any absorbing concernment of that sort, he does not trouble himself much about his ship in port, but leaves her to the owners till all is ready for sea. However, it is always as well to have a look at him before irrevocably committing yourself into his hands. Turning back, I accosted Captain Peleg, inquiring where Captain Ahab was to be found. "'And what dost thou want of Captain Ahab? It's all right enough, thou art shipped.' "'Yes, but I should like to see him.' "'But I don't think you will be able to at present.' I don't know exactly what's the matter with him, but he keeps close inside the house, a sort of sick, and yet he don't look so. In fact, he ain't sick, uh, but no, he isn't well, either. Anyhow, young man, he won't always see me, so I don't suppose he will thee. He's a queer man, Captain Ahab, so some think, but a good one. 
Oh, thou'lt like him well enough. No fear, no fear. He's a grand, ungodly, godlike man, Captain Ahab. Doesn't speak much, but when he does speak, then you may well listen. Mark ye, be forewarned. Ahab's above the common. Ahab's been in colleges, as well as amongst the cannibals, been used to deeper wonders than the waves, fixed his fiery lance in mightier, stranger foes than whales. His lance, ay, the keenest and the surest that out of all our isle. Oh, he ain't Captain Bildad, no, and he ain't Captain Peleg, he's Ahab, boy. And Ahab of old, thou knowest, was a crowned king. And a very vile one. When that wicked king was slain, the dogs, did they not lick his blood? Come hither to me. Hither, hither, said Peleg, with a significance in his eye that almost startled me. Look ye, lad, never say that on board the Pequod. Never say it anywhere. Captain Ahab did not name himself. T'was a foolish, ignorant whim of his crazy widowed mother, who died when he was only twelve month old. And yet the old squaw, Tistig, at Gayhead, said that the name would somehow prove prophetic. And perhaps other fools like her may tell thee the same. I wish to warn thee. It's a lie. I know Captain Ahab well. I've sailed with him as mate years ago. I know what he is. A good man. Not a pious good man like Bildad, but a swearing good man. Something like me. Only there's a good deal more of him. Ay, ay. I know that he was never very jolly, and I know that on the passage home he was a little out of his mind for a spell. But it was the sharp shooting pains in his bleeding stump that brought that about, as any one might see. I know, too, that ever since he lost his leg last voyage by that accursed whale, he's been a kind of moody, desperate moody, and savage sometimes. But that will all pass off. And once for all, let me tell ye and assure thee, young man, it's better to sail with a moody good captain than a laughing bad one. So good-bye to thee, and wrong not Captain Ahab, because he happens to have a wicked name. Besides, my boy, he has a wife, not three voyages wedded, a sweet, resigned girl. Think of that. And by that sweet girl that old man has a child. Hold ye, then, can there be any utter, hopeless harm in Ahab? No, no, my lad. Stricken, blasted if he be, Ahab has his humanities. As I walked away, I was full of thoughtfulness. What had been incidentally revealed to me of Captain Ahab filled me with a certain wild vagueness of painfulness concerning him, and somehow at the time I felt a sympathy and a sorrow for him, but for I don't know what, unless it was the cruel loss of his leg. And yet I also felt a strange awe of him, but that sort of awe which I cannot at all describe was not exactly awe. I do not know what it was, but I felt it, and it did not disincline me towards him, though I felt impatience at what seemed like mystery in him, so imperfectly as he was known to me then. However, my thoughts were at length carried in other directions, so that for the present dark Ahab slipped my mind. End of chapter 16 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 17 to 21. Chapter 17 The Ramadan. As Queequeg's Ramadan, or fasting and humiliation, was to continue all day, I did not choose to disturb him till towards nightfall, for I cherished the greatest respect towards everybody's religious obligations, never mind how comical, and couldn't find it in my heart to undervalue even a congregation of ants worshipping a toadstool, or those other creatures in certain parts of our earth who, with a degree of footmanism quite unprecedented in other planets, bow down before the torso of a deceased landed proprietor merely on account of the inordinate possessions yet owned and rented in his name. I say we good Presbyterian Christians should be charitable in these things, and not fancy ourselves so vastly superior to other mortals, pagans and what not, because of their half-crazy conceits on these subjects. 
There was Queequeg now, certainly entertaining the most absurd notions about Yojo and his Ramadan. But what of that? Queequeg thought he knew what he was about, I suppose. He seemed to be content, and there let him rest. All our arguing with him would not avail. Let him be, I say, and heaven have mercy on us all, Presbyterians and pagans alike, for we are all somehow dreadfully cracked about the head, and sadly need mending. Towards evening, when I felt assured that all his performances and rituals must be over, I went up to his room and knocked at the door, but no answer. I tried to open it, but it was fastened inside. Queequeg, said I, softly, through the keyhole, all silent. I say, Queequeg, why don't you speak? It's I, Ishmael. But all remained still as before. I began to grow alarmed. I had allowed him such abundant time, I thought he might have had an apoplectic fit. I looked through the keyhole, but the door opening into an odd corner of the room, the keyhole prospect was but a crooked and sinister one. I could only see part of the footboard of the bed, and a line of the wall, but nothing more. I was surprised to behold, resting against the wall, the wooden shaft of Queequeg's harpoon, which the landlady the evening previous had taken from him before our mounting to the chamber. That's strange, thought I. But at any rate, since the harpoon stands yonder, and he seldom or never goes abroad without it, therefore he must be inside here, and no possible mistake. Queequeg! Queequeg! All still. Something must have happened. Apoplexy. I tried to burst open the door, but it stubbornly resisted. Running downstairs, I quickly stated my suspicions to the first person I met, the chambermaid. La, la, she cried, I thought something must be the matter. I went to make the bed after breakfast, and the door was locked, and not a mouse to be heard, and it's been just so silent ever since. But I thought maybe you had both gone off and locked your baggage in for safe keeping. La, la, ma'am, mistress, murder, Mrs. Hussey, apoplexy. And with these cries she ran toward the kitchen, I following. Mrs. Hussey soon appeared with a mustard pot in one hand and a vinegar cruet in the other, having just broken away from the occupation of attending to the casters and scolding her little black boy meantime. Woodhouse, cried I, which way to it? Run, for God's sake, and fetch something to pry open the door. The axe, the axe, he's had a stroke, depend upon it. And so saying, I was unmethodically rushing upstairs again empty-handed, when Mrs. Hussey interposed the mustard pot and vinegar cruet and the entire castor of her countenance. "'What's the matter with you, young man?' "'Get the axe. For God's sake, run for the doctor, someone, while I pry it open.' "'Look here,' said the landlady, quickly putting down the vinegar cruet, so as to have one hand free. "'Look here. Are you talking about prying open any of my doors?' And with that she seized my arm. "'What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you, shipmate?' In as calm but as rapid a manner as possible, I gave her to understand the whole case. Unconsciously clapping the vinegar cruet to one side of her nose, she ruminated for an instant, then exclaimed, "'No, I haven't seen it since I put it there.' Running to the little closet under the landing of the stairs, she glanced in, and returning told me that Queequeg's harpoon was missing. "'He's killed himself!' she cried. "'It's unfortunate Stig's done over again!' There goes another counterpane. God pity his poor mother. It'll be the ruin of my house. Has the poor lad a sister? Where's that girl? There, Betty, go to Snarls the painter and tell him to paint me a sign with no suicides permitted here and no smoking in the parlor. Might as well kill both birds at once. Kill! Ah, oh, the Lord be merciful to his ghost. What's that noise there? You, young man, have asked there and running up after me, she caught me as I was again trying to force open the door. I don't allow it. I won't have my premises spoiled. Go for the locksmith. There's one about a mile from here. But avast, putting her hand in her side pocket, here's a key that'll fit, I guess. Let's see. And with that she turned it in the lock, but alas, Queequeg's supplemental bolt remained undrawn within. 
have to burst it open said i and was running down the entry a little for a good start when the landlady caught at me again vowing that i should not break down her premises but i tore from her and with a sudden bodily rush dashed myself full against the mark with a prodigious noise the door flew open and the knob slamming against the wall sent the plaster to the ceiling and there good heavens there sat queequeg altogether cool and self-collected right in the middle of his room squatting on his hams and holding yojo on the top of his head he looked neither one way nor the other way but sat like a carved image with scarce a sign of active life queequeg said i going up to him queequeg what's the matter with you he hain't been sitting so all day has he said the landlady but all we said not a word could we drag out of him i almost felt like pushing him over so as to change his position for it was almost intolerable it seemed so painfully and unnaturally constrained especially as in all probability he had been sitting so for upwards of eight or ten hours going too without his regular meals mrs hussey said i he's alive at all events so leave us if you please and i will see to this strange affair myself Closing the door upon the landlady, I endeavoured to prevail upon Queequeg to take a chair, but in vain. There he sat, and all he could do, for all my polite arts and blandishments, he would not move a peg, nor say a single word, nor even look at me, nor notice my presence in the slightest way. I wonder, thought I, if this can possibly be a part of his Ramadan. Do they fast on their hams that way in his native island? It must be so yes it's part of his creed i suppose well then let him rest he'll get up sooner or later no doubt it can't last for ever thank god and his ramadan only comes once a year and i don't believe it's very punctual then i went down to supper after sitting a long time listening to the long stories of some sailors who had just come from a plum pudding voyage as they call it uh, that is a short whaling voyage in a schooner or brig confined to the north of the line in the atlantic ocean only after listening to these plum puddingers till nearly eleven o'clock i went upstairs to go to bed feeling quite sure by this time queequeg must certainly have brought his ramadan to a termination but no there he was just where i had left him he had not stirred an inch I began to grow vexed with him. It seemed so downright senseless and insane to be sitting there all day and half the night on his hams in a cold room, holding a piece of wood on his head. For heaven's sake, Queequeg, get up and shake yourself. Get up and have some supper. You'll starve. You'll kill yourself, Queequeg. But not a word did he reply. Despairing of him, therefore, I determined to go to bed and to sleep, and no doubt before a great while he would follow me. But previous to turning in, I took my heavy bearskin jacket and threw it over him, as it promised to be a very cold night, and he had nothing but his ordinary round jacket on. For some time, do all I would, I could not get into the faintest doze. I had blown out the candle, and the mere thought of Queequeg, not four feet off, sitting there in that uneasy position, stark alone, in the cold and dark, this made me really wretched. Think of it sleeping all night in the same room with a wide-awake pagan on his hams in this dreary, unaccountable Ramadan. But somehow I dropped off at last, and knew nothing more till break of day, when, looking over the bedside, there squatted Queequeg, as if he had been screwed down to the floor. But as soon as the first glimpse of sun entered the window, up he got, with stiff and grating joints, but with a cheerful look, limped towards me where I lay, pressed his forehead against mine, and said his Ramadan was over. Now, as I before hinted, I have no objection to any person's religion, be it what it may, so long as that person does not kill or insult any other person, because that other person don't believe it also. But when a man's religion becomes really frantic, when it is a positive torment to him, and, in fine, makes this earth of ours an uncomfortable inn to lodge in, then I think it high time to take that individual aside and argue the point with him. And just so I now did with Queequeg. Queequeg, said I, get into bed now and lie and listen with me. 
Then I went on, beginning with the rise and progress of the primitive religions, and coming down to the various religions of the present time, during which time I laboured to show Queequeg that all these Lents, Ramadans, and prolonged ham-squattings in cold, cheerless rooms were stark nonsense, bad for the health, useless for the soul, opposed, in short, to the obvious laws of hygiene and common sense. I told him, too, that he, being in other things such an extremely sensible and sagacious savage, it pained me, very badly pained me, to see him now so deplorably foolish about this ridiculous Ramadan of his. Besides, argued I, fasting makes the body cave in, hence the spirit caves in, and all thoughts born of a fast must necessarily be half-starved, this is the reason why most dyspeptic religionists cherish such melancholy notions about their hereafters. In one word, Queequeg, said I, rather digressively, hell is an idea first born on an undigested apple dumpling, and since then perpetuated through the hereditary dyspepsias nurtured by Ramadans. I then asked Queequeg whether he himself was ever troubled with dyspepsia, expressing the idea very plainly so that he could take it in. He said no, only upon one memorable occasion. It was after a great feast given by his father, the king, on the gaining of a great battle wherein fifty of the enemy had been killed by about two o'clock in the afternoon, and all cooked and eaten that very evening. No more, Queequeg, said I, shuddering. That will do, for I knew the inferences without his further hinting them. I had seen a sailor who had visited that very island, and he told me that it was the custom, when a great battle had been gained there, to barbecue all the slain in the yard or garden of the victor, and then, one by one, they were placed in great wooden trenchers, and garnished round like a pillow, with breadfruit and coconuts, and with some parsley in their mouths, were sent round with the victor's compliments to all his friends, just as though these presents were so many Christmas turkeys. After all, I do not think that my remarks about religion made much of an impression on Queequeg, because, in the first place, he somehow seemed dull of hearing on that important subject, unless considered from his own point of view, and, in the second place, he did not more than one-third understand me, couch my ideas as simply as I would, and, finally, he no doubt thought he knew a good deal more about true religion than I did. He looked at me with a sort of condescending concern and compassion, as though he thought it a great pity that such a sensible young man should be so hopelessly lost to evangelical pagan piety. At last we rose and dressed, and Queequeg, taking a prodigiously hearty breakfast of chowders of all sorts, so that the landlady should not make much profit by reason of his Ramadan, we sallied out to board the Pequod, sauntering along and picking our teeth with halibut bones. CHAPTER Eighteen, HIS MARK As we were walking down the end of the wharf towards the ship, Queequeg carrying his harpoon, Captain Peleg, in his gruff voice, loudly hailed us from his wigwam, saying he had not suspected my friend was a cannibal, and furthermore announcing that he let no cannibals on board that craft unless they previously produced their papers. "'What do you mean by that, Captain Peleg?' said I, now jumping on the bulwarks, and leaving my comrade standing on the wharf. "'I mean,' he replied, "'he must show his papers.' "'Yes,' said Captain Bildad, in his hollow voice, sticking his head from behind Peleg's out of the wigwam. "'He must show that he's converted. "'Son of darkness,' he added, turning to Queequeg, "'art thou at present in communion with any Christian church?' Why, said I, he is a member of the first congregational church. Here be it said that many tattooed savages sailing in Nantucket ships at last come to be converted into churches. First congregational church, cried Bildad. What, that worships in Deacon Deuteronomy Coleman's meeting-house? And so saying, taking out his spectacles, he rubbed them with his great yellow bandana handkerchief, and putting them on very carefully, came out of the wigwam, and leaning stiffly over the bulwarks, took a good long look at Queequeg. "'How long hath he been a member?' he then said, turning to me. "'Not very long, I rather guess, young man.' "'No,' said Peleg. "'And he hasn't been baptized right either, or it would have washed some of that devil's blue off his face.' "'Do tell now,' 
cried Bildad. Is this Philistine a regular member of Deacon Deuteronomy's meeting? I never saw him going there, and I pass it every Lord's Day. I don't know anything about Deacon Deuteronomy or his meeting, said I. All I know is that Queequeg here is a born member of the First Congregational Church. He is a deacon himself, Queequeg is. Young man, said Bildad sternly, thou art skylarking with me. Explain thyself, thou young Hittite. What church dost thee mean? Answer me. Finding myself thus hard pushed, I replied, I mean, sir, the same ancient Catholic church to which you and I and Captain Peleg there and Queequeg here and all of us and every mother's son and soul of us belong, the great and everlasting first congregation of this whole worshipping world. We all belong to that. Only some of us cherish some queer crotchets in no way touching the grand belief. In that we all join hands. Splice, thou meanst, splice hands! cried Peleg, drawing nearer. Young man, you'd better ship for a missionary instead of a foremast hand. I never heard a better sermon. Deacon Deuteronomy, why, Father Mapple himself couldn't beat it, and he's reckoned something. Come aboard, come aboard, never mind about the papers. I say, tell Quahog there, what's that you call him? Tell Quahog to step along. By the great anchor, what a harpoon he's got there. Looks like good stuff, that and he handles it about right. I say, Quahog, or whatever your name is, did you ever stand in the head of a whale-boat? Did you ever strike a fish? Without saying a word, Queequeg, in his wild sort of way, jumped upon the bulwarks, from thence into the bows of one of the whale-boats hanging to the side, and then bracing his left knee and poising his harpoon, cried out in some such way as this, Cap'n, you see him small drop tar on water there. You see him? Well, suppose him one whale eye. Well, den. And taking sharp aim at it, he darted the iron right over Bildad's broad brim, clean across the ship's deck, and struck the glistening tar spot out of sight. Now, said Queequeg, quietly hauling in the line, suppose him whaley eye. Why, dat whale dead. Quick, Bildad, said Peleg, his partner, who, aghast at the close vicinity of the flying harpoon, had retreated towards the cabin gangway. Quick, I say you, Bildad, and get the ship's papers. We must have Hedgehog, the, I mean Quahog, in one of our boats. Look ye, Quahog, we'll give ye the ninetieth lay, and that's more than ever was given a harpooner yet out of Nantucket. So down we went into the cabin, and to my great joy, Queequeg was soon enrolled among the same ship's company to which I myself belonged. When all preliminaries were over, and Peleg had got everything ready for signing, he turned to me and said, I guess Quahog there don't know how to write, does he? I say, Quahog, blast ye! Dost thou sign thy name, or make thy mark? But at this question, Queequeg, who had twice or thrice before taken part in similar ceremonies, looked no ways abashed, but taking the offered pen, copied upon the paper in the proper place, an exact counterpart of the queer round figure which was tattooed upon his arm, so that through Captain Peleg's obstinate mistake touching his appellative, it stood something like this. Quahog, his mark, X. Meanwhile, Captain Bildad sat earnestly and steadfastly eyeing Queequeg, and at last, rising solemnly and fumbling in the huge pockets of his broad-skirted drab coat, took out a bundle of tracts, and selecting one entitled, The Latter Day Coming, or No Time to Lose, placed it in Queequeg's hands, and grasping them and the book with both his, looked earnestly into his eyes, and said, Son of darkness, I must do my duty by thee. I am part owner of this ship, and feel concerned for the souls of all its crew." If thou still clingest to thy pagan ways, which I sadly fear, I beseech thee, remain not for I a belial bondsman. Spurn the idle bell, and the hideous dragon. Turn from the wrath to come. Mind thine eye, I say. Ah, oh, goodness gracious, steer clear of the fiery pit. Something of the salt sea yet lingered in old Bildad's language, heterogeneously mixed with scriptural and domestic phrases. 
Avast there, avast there, Bildad, avast now spoiling our harpooner, cried Peleg. Pious harpooners never make good voyagers. It takes the shark out of them. No harpooner is worth a straw who ain't pretty sharkish. There was young Nat Swain, once the bravest boat-header out of all Nantucket in the vineyard. He joined the meeting and never came to good. He got so frightened about his plaguy soul that he shrinked and steered away from whales, for fear of afterclaps, in case he got stove and went to Davy Jones. Peleg, Peleg, said Bildad, lifting his eyes and hands, thou thyself, as I myself, hast seen many a perilous time. Thou knowest, Peleg, what it is to have the fear of death. How then canst thou prate in this ungodly guise? Thou beliest thine own heart, Peleg. Tell me, when this same Pequod here had her three masts overboard in that typhoon on Japan, that same voyage when thou went mate with Captain Ahab, didst thou not think of death and the judgment then? Hear him, hear him now, cried Peleg, marching across the cabin and thrusting his hands far down into his pockets. Hear him, all of ye. Think of that, when every moment we thought the ship would sink. Death and the judgment then? What? With all three masts making such an everlasting thundering against the side and every sea breaking over us fore and aft? Think of death and the judgment then? No, no time to think about death then. Life was what Captain Ahab and I was thinking of, and how to save all hands, how to rig jury masts, how to get into the nearest port. That's what I was thinking of. Bildad said no more, but buttoning up his coat, stalked on deck, where we followed him. There he stood, very quietly overlooking some sailmakers who were mending a topsail in the waist. Now and then he stooped to pick up a patch or save an end of tarred twine, which otherwise might have been wasted. Chapter 19 The Prophet Shipmates, have ye shipped in that ship? Queequeg and I had just left the Pequod, and were sauntering away from the water, for the moment each occupied with his own thoughts, when the above words were put to us by a stranger, who, pausing before us, leveled his massive forefinger at the vessel in question. He was but shabbily apparelled in faded jacket and patched trousers, a rag of a black handkerchief investing his neck. A confluent smallpox had in all directions flowed over his face, and left it like the complicated ribbed bed of a torrent when the rushing waters have been dried up. "'Have you shipped in her?' he repeated. "'You mean the ship Pequod, I suppose,' said I, trying to gain a little more time for an uninterrupted look at him. "'Aye, the Pequod. That ship there.' he said, drawing back his whole arm, and then rapidly shoving it straight out from him, with the fixed bayonet of his pointed finger darted full at the object. "'Yes,' said I, "'we have just signed the articles.' "'Anything down there about your souls?' "'About what?' "'Oh, perhaps you haven't got any,' he said quickly. "'No matter, though. I know many chaps that haven't got any. Good luck to him, and they are all the better off for it.' A soul's a sort of a fifth wheel to a wagon. What are you jabbering about, shipmate? said I. He's got enough, though, to make up for all deficiencies of that sort and other chaps. Abruptly said the stranger, placing a nervous emphasis upon the word he. Queequeg, said I, let's go. This fellow has broken loose from somewhere. He's talking about something and somebody we don't know. Stop, cried the stranger. You said true. "'You haven't seen Old Thunder yet, have ye?' "'Who's Old Thunder?' said I, again riveted with the insane earnestness of his manner. "'Captain Ahab.' "'What, the captain of our ship, the Pequod?' "'Aye, among some of us old sailor chaps he goes by that name. "'You haven't seen him yet, have ye?' "'No, we haven't. He's sick, they say, but is getting better, and will be all right again before long.' "'All right again before long,' <laughs> laughed the stranger, with a solemnly derisive sort of laugh. "'Look ye, when Captain Ahab is all right, then this left arm of mine will be all right, not before.' "'What do you know about him?' "'What did they tell you about him? Say that.' 
They didn't tell much of anything about him, only I've heard he's a good whale hunter and a good captain to his crew. That's true. That's true. Yes, both true enough. But you must jump when he gives an order. Step and growl, growl and go. That's the word with Captain Ahab. But nothing about the thing that happened to him off Cape Horn long ago, when he lay like dead for three days and nights. Nothing about that deadly scrimmage with the Spaniard before the altar in Santa. Heard nothing about that, eh? Nothing about the silver calabash he spat into. And nothing about losing his leg last voyage, according to the prophecy. Didn't you hear a word about them matters and something more, eh? No, I don't think you did. How could ye? Who knows it? Not all Nantucket, I guess. But how's ever, mayhap, you've heard tell about the leg, and how he lost it. Ay, you've heard of that, I dare say. Oh, yes, that everyone knows a most. I mean, they know he's only one leg, and that a parma said he took the other off. My friend, said I, what all this gibberish of yours is about, I don't know, and I don't much care, for it seems to me that you must be a little damaged in the head. But if you are speaking of Captain Ahab, of that ship there, the Pequod, then let me tell you that I know all about the loss of his leg. All about it, eh? Sure you do? All? Pretty sure. With finger pointed and eye levelled at the Pequod, the beggar-like stranger stood a moment, as if in troubled reverie, and then, starting a little, turned and said, "'You've shipped, have ye? Names down on the papers? Well, well, what's signed is signed, and what's to be will be, and then again perhaps it won't be, after all. Anyhow, it's all fixed and arranged already, and some sailors or other must go with him, I suppose, as well these as any other men, God pity em. "'Morning to you, shipmates, morning.' The ineffable heavens bless ye. I'm sorry I stopped ye. Look here, friend, said I. If you have anything important to tell us, out with it. But if you are only trying to bamboozle us, you're mistaken in your game. That's all I have to say. And it's said very well. And I like to hear a chap talk up that way. You are just the man for him. The likes of you. Morning to your shipmates. Morning. Oh, when you get there... Tell him I've concluded not to make one of them. Ah, oh, my dear fellow, you can't fool us that way. You can't fool us. It is the easiest thing in the world for a man to look as if he had a great secret in him. Morning to you, shipmates. Morning. Morning it is, said I. Come along, Queequeg, let's leave this crazy man. But stop. Tell me your name, will you? Elijah. Elijah, thought I and we walked away, both commenting after each other's fashion upon this ragged old sailor, and agreed that he was nothing but a humbug trying to be a bugbear. But we had not gone perhaps above a hundred yards when chancing to turn a corner and looking back as I did so, who should be seen but Elijah following us, though at a distance? Somehow the sight of him struck me so that I said nothing to Queequeg of his being behind— but passed on with my comrade, anxious to see whether the stranger would turn the same corner that we did. He did, and then it seemed to me that he was dogging us, but with what intent I could not for the life of me imagine. This circumstance, coupled with his ambiguous half-hinting, half-revealing, shrouded sort of talk, now begat in me all kinds of vague wonderments and half-apprehensions, and all connected with the Pequod and Captain Ahab, and the leg he had lost, and the Cape Horn fit, and the silver calabash, and what Captain Peleg had said of him when I left the ship on the day previous, and the prediction of the squaw Tistig, and the voyage we had bound ourselves to sail, and a hundred other shadowy things. I was resolved to satisfy myself whether this ragged Elijah was really dogging us or not, and with that intent crossed the way with Queequeg, and on that side of it retraced our steps. But Elijah passed on without seeming to notice us. This relieved me, and once more and finally, as it seemed to me, I pronounced him, in my heart, a humbug. CHAPTER Twenty, ALL ASTIR A day or two passed, and there was great activity aboard the Pequod. Not only were the old sails being mended, but new sails were coming on board, and bolts of canvas and coils of rigging, 
In short, everything betokened that the ship's preparations were hurrying to a close. Captain Peleg seldom or never went ashore, but sat in his wigwam, keeping a sharp lookout upon the hands. Bildad did all the purchasing and providing at the stores, and the men employed in the hold and on the rigging were working till long after nightfall. On the day following Queequeg signing the articles, word was given at all the inns where the ship's company were stopping that their chests must be on board before night, for there was no telling how soon the vessel might be sailing. So Queequeg got down our traps, resolving, however, to sleep ashore till the last. But it seems they always give very long notice in these cases, and the ship did not sail for several days. But no wonder, there was a good deal to be done, and there is no telling how many things to be thought of before the Pequod was fully equipped. Everyone knows what a multitude of things, beds, saucepans, knives and forks, shovels and tongs, napkins, nutcrackers and what not, are indispensable to the business of housekeeping, just so with whaling, which necessitates the three years' housekeeping upon the wide ocean far from all grocers, costermongers, doctors, bakers, and bankers. And though this also holds true of merchant vessels, yet not by any means to the same extent as with whalemen. For besides the great length of the whaling voyage, the numerous articles peculiar to the prosecution of the fishery, and the impossibility of replacing them at the remote harbors usually frequented, it must be remembered that of all ships, whaling vessels are the most exposed to accidents of all kinds, and especially to the destruction and loss of the very things upon which the success of the voyage most depends. Hence the spare boats, spare spars, and spare lines and harpoons, and spare everythings almost but a spare captain and duplicate ship. At the period of our arrival at the island, the heaviest storage of the Pequod had been almost completed, comprising her beef, bread, water, fuel, and iron hoops and staves. But as before hinted, for some time there was a continual fetching and carrying on board of diverse odds and ends of things, both large and small. Chief among those who did this fetching and carrying was Captain Bildad's sister, a lean old lady of a most determined and indefatigable spirit, but withal very kind-hearted, who seemed resolved that if she could help it, nothing should be found wanting in the Pequod, after once fairly getting to sea. At one time she would come on board with a jar of pickles for the steward's pantry, another time with a bunch of quills for the chief mate's desk, where he kept his log, a third time with a roll of flannel for the small of someone's rheumatic back. Never did any woman better deserve her name, which was Charity, Aunt Charity, as everyone called her. And like a sister of Charity did this charitable Aunt Charity bustle about, hither and thither, ready to turn her hand and heart to anything that promised to yield safety, comfort, and consolation to all on board a ship in which her beloved brother Bildad was concerned, and in which she herself owned a score or two of well-saved dollars. But it was startling to see this excellent-hearted Quakeress coming on board, as she did the last day, with a long oil ladle in one hand and a still longer whaling lance in the other. Nor was Bildad himself nor Captain Peleg at all backward. As for Bildad, he carried about with him a long list of the articles needed, and at every fresh arrival down went his mark opposite that article upon the paper. Every once in a while Peleg came hobbling out of his whalebone den, roaring at the men down the hatchways, roaring up to the riggers at the masthead, and then concluding by roaring back into his wigwam. During these days of preparation Queequeg and I often visited the craft, and as often I asked about Captain Ahab, and how he was, and when he was going to come on board his ship. To these questions they would answer that he was getting better and better, and was expected aboard every day. Meantime the two captains, Peleg and Bildad, could attend to everything necessary to fit the vessel for the voyage. If I had been downright honest with myself, I would have seen very plainly in my heart that I did but half fancy being committed this way to so long a voyage, without once laying my eyes on the man who was to be the absolute dictator of it, so soon as the ship sailed out upon the open sea. But when a man suspects any wrong, it sometimes happens that if he be already involved in the matter, he insensibly strives to cover up his suspicions even from himself. And much this way it was with me. 
I said nothing and tried to think nothing. At last it was given out that some time next day the ship would certainly sail, so next morning Queequeg and I took a very early start. Chapter 21 Going Aboard It was nearly six o'clock, but only grey, imperfect, misty dawn when we drew nigh the wharf. "'There are some sailors running ahead there, if I see right,' said I to Queequeg. "'It can't be shadows. She's off by sunrise, I guess. Come on.' "'Avast!' cried a voice, whose owner, at the same time coming close behind us, laid a hand upon both our shoulders, and then, insinuating himself between us, stood stooping forward a little, in the uncertain twilight, strangely peering from Queequeg to me. It was Elijah. "'Going aboard?' "'Hands off, will you?' said I. "'Looky here,' said Queequeg, shaking himself. "'Go away!' "'Ain't going aboard, then?' "'Yes, we are,' said I. "'But what business is that of yours? "'Do you know, Mr. Elijah, that I consider you a little impertinent?' "'No, no, no, I wasn't aware of that,' said Elijah, "'slowly and wonderingly looking from me to Queequeg "'with the most unaccountable glances. "'Elijah,' said I, you will oblige my friend and me by withdrawing. We are going to the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and would prefer not to be detained. Ye be, be ye, coming back before breakfast? He's cracked, Queequeg, said I. Come on. Hello, cried stationary Elijah, hailing us when we had removed a few paces. Never mind him, said I. Queequeg, come on. But he stole up to us again, and suddenly clapping his hands on my shoulder, said, did you see anything looking like men going towards that ship a while ago? Struck by this plain, matter-of-fact question, I answered, saying, Yes, I thought I did see four or five men, but it was too dim to be sure. Very dim, very dim, said Elijah. Morning to ye. Once more we quitted him, but once more he came softly after us, and touching my shoulder again, said, See if you can find em now, will ye? Find who? Morning to ye, morning to ye, he rejoined, again moving off. Oh, I was going to warn you against... But never mind, never mind. It's all one, all in the family, too. Sharp frost this morning, ain't it? Good-bye to ye. Shan't see you again very soon, I guess, unless it's before the grand jury. And with these cracked words he finally departed, leaving me for the moment in no small wonderment at his frantic impudence. At last, stepping on board the Pequod, we found everything in profound quiet, not a soul moving. The cabin entrance was locked within, the hatches were all on, and lumbered with coils of rigging. Going forward to the forecastle, we found the slide of the scuttle open. Seeing a light, we went down, and found only an old rigger there, wrapped in a tattered pea-jacket. He was thrown at whole length upon two chests, his face downwards and enclosed in his folded arms. The profoundest slumber slept upon him. "'Those sailors we saw, Queequeg, where can they have gone to?' said I, looking dubiously at the sleeper. But it seemed that, when on the wharf, Queequeg had not at all noticed what I now alluded to. Hence I would have thought myself to have been optically deceived in that matter were it not for Elijah's otherwise inexplicable question." But I beat the thing down, and again marking the sleeper, jocularly hinted to Queequeg that perhaps we had best sit up with the body, telling him to establish himself accordingly. He put his hand upon the sleeper's rear, as though feeling if it was soft enough, and then, without more ado, quietly sat down there. "'Gracious, Queequeg, don't sit there,' said I. "'Oh, Perry dood seat,' said Queequeg. "'My country way. Won't hurt him, face.' "'Face,' said I, "'call that his face? "'A very benevolent countenance, then. "'But how hard he breathes! "'He's heaving himself. "'Get off, Queequeg, you're heavy. "'It's grinding the face of the poor. "'Get off, Queequeg. "'Look, he'll twitch you off soon. "'I wonder he don't wake.' "'Queequeg removed himself to just beyond the head of the sleeper "'and lighted his tomahawk pipe. "'I sat at the feet. "'We kept the pipe passing over the sleeper "'and from one to the other.' Meanwhile, upon questioning him in his broken fashion, Queequeg gave me to understand that in his land, owing to the absence of settees and sofas of all sorts, the kings, chiefs, and great people generally were in the custom of fattening some of the lower orders for Ottomans, 
and to furnish a house comfortably in that respect you had only to buy up eight or ten lazy fellows and lay them round in the piers and alcoves besides it was very convenient on an excursion much better than those garden chairs which are convertible into walking sticks upon occasion a chief calling his attendant and desiring him to make a settee of himself under a spreading tea perhaps in some damp marshy place while narrating these things every time queequeg received the tomahawk from me he flourished the hatchet side of it over the sleeper's head what's that for queequeg Perry easy killy oh perry easy he was going on with some wild reminiscences about his tomahawk pipe which it seemed had in its two uses both brained his foes and soothed his soul when we were directly attracted to the sleeping rigor the strong vapor was now completely filling the contracted hole it began to tell upon him he breathed with a sort of muffledness then seemed troubled in the nose then revolved over once or twice then sat up and rubbed his eyes hello he breathed at last who be ye smokers shipped men answered i when does she sail ay ay you're a going in her be ye she sails to-day the captain came aboard last night what captain ahab who but him indeed i was going to ask him some further questions concerning ahab when we heard a noise on deck hello starbucks astir said the rigger he's a lively chief mate that good man and a pious but all alive now i must turn too and so saying he went on deck and we followed it was now clear sunrise soon the crew came on board in twos and threes the riggers bestirred themselves the mates were actively engaged and several of the shore people were busy in bringing various last things on board meanwhile captain ahab remained invisibly enshrined within his cabin End of chapter 17 to 21This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 22 through 25. Chapter 22 Merry Christmas at length towards noon upon the final dismissal of the ship's riggers and after the pequod had been hauled for out from the wharf and after the ever thoughtful charity had come off in a whaleboat with her last gift a nightcap for stubb the second mate her brother-in-law and a spare bible for the steward after all this the two captains peleg and bildad issued from the cabin and turning to the chief mate peleg said now mr starbuck are you sure everything is all right captain ahab is all ready just spoke to him nothing more to be got from shore eh well call all hands then muster em aft here blast em no need of profane words however great the hurry peleg said bildad but away with thee friend starbuck and do our bidding how now here upon the very point of starting for the voyage captain peleg and captain bildad were going it with a high hand on the quarter-deck just as if they were to be joint commanders at sea as well as to all appearances in port and as for captain ahab no sign of him was yet to be seen only they said he was in the cabin but then the idea was that his presence was by no means necessary in getting the ship under way and steering her well out to sea indeed as that was not at all his proper business but the pilot's and as he was not yet completely recovered so they said therefore captain ahab stayed below and all this seemed natural enough especially as in the merchant service many captains never show themselves on deck for a considerable time after heaving up the anchor but remain over the cabin table having a farewell merry-making with their shore friends before they quit the ship for good with the pilot but there was not much chance to think over the matter for captain peleg was now all alive he seemed to do most of the talking and commanding and not bildad aft here ye sons of bachelors he cried as the sailors lingered at the mainmast mr starbuck drive em aft strike the tent there was the next order 
As I hinted before, this whalebone marquee was never pitched except in port, and on board the Pequod for thirty years the order to strike the tent was well known to be the next thing to heaving up the anchor. "'Man the capstan! Blood and thunder! Jump!' was the next command, and the crew sprang for the handspikes. Now in getting under way, the station generally occupied by the pilot is the forward part of the ship, and here Bildad, who, with Peleg be it known, in addition to his other officers, was one of the licensed pilots of the port, he being suspected to have got himself made a pilot in order to save the Nantucket pilot fee to all the ships he was concerned in, for he never piloted any other craft, Bildad, I say, might now be seen actively engaged in looking over the bows for the approaching anchor, and at intervals singing what seemed a dismal stave of psalmody to cheer the hands at the windlass, who roared forth some sort of chorus about the girls in Booble Alley, with a hearty good will. Nevertheless, not three days previous, Bildad had told them that no profane songs would be allowed on board the Pequod, particularly in getting under way and Charity, his sister, had placed a small, choice copy of Watts in each seaman's berth. Meantime, overseeing the other part of the ship, Captain Peleg ripped and swore astern in the most frightful manner. I almost thought he would sink the ship before the anchor could be got up. Involuntarily I paused on my handspike and told Queequeg to do the same, thinking of the perils we both ran in starting on the voyage with such a devil for a pilot. I was comforting myself, however, with the thought that in pious Bildad might be found some salvation, spite of his 777th lay, when I felt a sudden sharp poke in my rear, and, turning round, was horrified at the apparition of Captain Peleg in the act of withdrawing his leg from my immediate vicinity. That was my first kick. "'Is that the way they heave in the merchant service?' he roared. "'Spring, thou sheephead, spring, and break thy backbone. "'Why don't you spring, I say, all of you? "'Spring, quahog, spring, thou chap with the red whiskers, "'spring there, scotch cap, spring, thou green pants, "'spring, I say, all of you, and spring your eyes out.' "'And so saying, he moved along the windlass, "'here and there using his leg very freely.' while imperturbable Bildad kept leading off with his psalmody. Thinks I, Captain Peleg must have been drinking something today. At last the anchor was up, the sails were set, and off we glided. It was a short, cold Christmas, and as the short northern day merged into night, we found ourselves almost broad upon the wintry ocean, whose freezing spray cased us in ice as in polished armor, the long rows of teeth on the bulwarks glistened in the moonlight, and like the white ivory tusks of some huge elephant, vast curving icicles depended from the bows. Lank Bildad, as pilot, headed the first watch, and ever and anon, as the old craft deep-dived into the green seas, and sent the shivering frost all over her, and the winds howled and the cordage rang, his steady notes were heard. Sweet fields beyond the swelling flood stand dressed in living green, so to the Jews old Canaan stood, while Jordan rolled between. Never did those sweet words sound more sweetly to me than then. They were full of hope and fruition. Spite of this frigid winter night in the boisterous Atlantic, spite of my wet feet and wetter jacket, there was yet, it then seemed to me, many a pleasant haven in store, and meads and glades so eternally vernal that the grass shot up by the spring, untrodden, unwilted, remains at midsummer. At last we gained such an offing that the two pilots were needed no longer. The stout sailboat that had accompanied us began ranging alongside. It was curious and not unpleasing how Peleg and Bildad were affected at this juncture, especially Captain Bildad, for loath to depart yet, very loath to leave, for good, a ship bound on so long and perilous a voyage, beyond both stormy capes, a ship in which some thousands of his hard-earned dollars were invested, a ship in which an old shipmate sailed as captain, a man almost as old as he, once more starting to encounter all the terrors of the pitiless jaw, loath to say good-bye to a thing so every way brimful of every interest to him, 
Poor old Bildad lingered long, paced the deck with anxious strides, ran down into the cabin to speak another farewell word there, again came on deck, and looked to windward, looked towards the wide and endless waters, only bounded by the far-off, unseen eastern continents, looked toward the land, looked aloft, looked right and left, looked everywhere and nowhere, and at last, mechanically coiling a rope upon its pin, convulsively grasped stout Peleg by the hand, and holding up a lantern for the moment, stood gazing heroically in his face, as much to say, Nevertheless, friend Peleg, I can stand it. Yes, I can. As for Peleg himself, he took it more like a philosopher. But for all his philosophy, there was a tear twinkling in his eye when the lantern came too near. And he, too, did not a little run from cabin to deck. Now a word below, now a word with Starbuck, the chief mate. But at last he turned to his comrade with a final sort of look about him. "'Captain Bildad! Come, old shipmate, we must go. Back the main-yard there. Boat ahoy! Stand by to come close alongside now. Careful, careful. Come, Bildad, boy, say your last. Luck to you, Starbuck. Luck to you, Mr. Stubb. Luck to you, Mr. Flask. Good-bye, and good luck to you all. And this day three years I'll have a hot supper smoking for ye in old Nantucket. Hurrah and away! God bless ye, and have ye in his holy keeping, men, murmured old Bildad almost incoherently. I hope you'll have fine weather now, so that Captain Ahab may soon be moving among ye. A pleasant sun is all he needs, and you'll have plenty of them in the tropic voyage you go. Be careful in the hunt, ye mates. Don't stave the boats needlessly, ye harpeneers. Good white cedar plank is raised full three per cent within the year. Don't forget your prayers, either. Mr. Starbuck, mind that cooper don't waste the spare staves. Oh, the sail-needles are in the green locker. Don't wail it too much on the Lord's days, men. But don't miss a fair chance, either. That's rejecting heaven's good gifts. Have an eye to the molasses, Tierce, Mr. Stubb. It was a little leaky, I thought. If you touch at the islands, Mr. Flask, beware of fornication. Good-bye, good-bye. Don't keep that cheese too long down in the hold, Mr. Starbuck. It'll spoil. Be careful with the butter. Twenty cents the pound it was. And mind ye if... Come, come, Captain Bildad, stop palavering. Away! And with that, Peleg hurried him over the side, and both dropped into the boat. Ship and boat diverged. The cold, damp night breeze blew between. A screaming gull flew overhead. The two hulls wildly rolled. We gave three heavy-hearted cheers, and blindly plunged, like fate, into the lone Atlantic. Chapter 23. The Lee Shore. Some chapters back, one Bulkington was spoken of, a tall, new-landed mariner encountered in New Bedford at the inn. When on that shivering winter's night the Pequod thrust her vindictive bows into the cold, malicious waves, who should I see standing at her helm but Bulkington? I looked with sympathetic awe and fearfulness upon the man, who in midwinter just landed from a four years' dangerous voyage, could so unrestingly push off again for still another tempestuous term. The land seemed scorching to his feet. Wonderfulest things are ever the unmentionable. Deep memories yield no epitaphs. This six-inch chapter is the stoneless grave of Bulkington. Let me only say that it fared with him as with the storm-tossed ship, that miserably drives along the lured land. The port would fain give succor. The port is pitiful. In the port is safety, comfort, hearthstone, supper, warm blankets, friends, all that's kind to our mortalities. But in that gale, the port, the land, is that ship's direst jeopardy. She must fly all hospitality, one touch of land, though it but graze the keel, would make her shudder through and through. With all her might she crowds all sail offshore. In so doing, fights against the very winds that fain would blow her homeward, seeks all the lashed sea's landlessness again. 
for refuge's sake forlornly rushing into peril, her only friend, her bitterest foe. Know ye now, Bulkington? Glimpses do you seem to see of that mortally intolerable truth, that all deep, earnest thinking is but the intrepid effort of the soul to keep the open independence of her sea, while the wildest winds of heaven and earth conspire to cast her on the treacherous, slavish shore. But as in landlessness alone resides highest truth, sureless, indefinite as God, so better it is to perish in that howling infinite than be ingloriously dashed upon the lee, even if that were safety. For worm-like then, oh, who would craven crawl to land, terrors of the terrible. Is all this agony so vain? Take heart, take heart, O Bulkington, bear thee grimly, demigod, up from the spray of thy ocean perishing, straight up leaps thy apotheosis. CHAPTER Twenty Four, THE ADVOCATE As Queequeg and I are now fairly embarked in this business of whaling, and as this business of whaling has somehow come to be regarded among landsmen as a rather unpoetical and disreputable pursuit, therefore I am all anxiety to convince you, ye landsmen, of the injustice hereby done to us hunters of whales. In the first place, it may be deemed almost superfluous to establish the fact that among people at large the business of whaling is not accounted on a level with what are called the liberal professions, if a stranger were introduced into any miscellaneous metropolitan society, it would but slightly advance the general opinion of his merits were he presented to the company as a harpooner, say, and if in emulation of the naval officers he should append the initials SWF, sperm whale fishery, to his visiting card, such a procedure would be deemed preeminently presuming and ridiculous. Doubtless one leading reason why the world declines honoring us whalemen is this. They think that at best our vocation amounts to a butchering sort of business, and that when actively engaged therein we are surrounded by all manner of defilements. Butchers we are, that is true. But butchers also, and butchers of the bloodiest badge, have been all the martial commanders whom the world invariably delights to honor. And as for the matter of the alleged uncleanliness of our business, you shall soon be initiated into certain facts, hitherto pretty generally unknown, and which, upon the whole, will triumphantly plant the sperm-whale ship at least among the cleanliest things of this tidy earth. But even granting the charge in question to be true, what disordered slippery decks of a whale-ship are comparable to the unspeakable carrion of those battlefields from which so many soldiers return to drink in all ladies' plaudits? And if the idea of peril so much enhances the popular conceit of the soldier's profession, let me assure you that many a veteran who has freely marched up to a battery would quickly recoil at the apparition of the sperm-whale's vast tail, fanning into eddies the air over his head. For what are the comprehensible terrors of man compared with the interlinked terrors and wonders of God? But though the world scouts at us whale-hunters, yet does it unwittingly pay us the profoundest homage, yea, an all-abounding adoration. For almost all the tapers, lamps, and candles that burn round the globe burn as before so many shrines to our glory." But look at this matter in other lights. Weigh it in all sorts of scales. See what we whalemen are and have been. Why did the Dutch in De Witt's time have admirals of their whaling fleets? Why did Louis the Sixteenth of France, at his own personal expense, fit out whaling ships from Dunkirk and politely invite to that town some score or two of families from our own island of Nantucket? Why did Britain, between the years 1750 and 1788, pay her whalemen in bounties of upwards of one million pounds? And lastly, how comes it that we whalemen of America now outnumber all the rest of the banded whalemen in the world, sail a navy of upwards of seven hundred vessels, manned by eighteen thousand men, yearly consuming four million of dollars, 
the ship's worth at the time of sailing twenty million dollars, and every year importing into our harbors a well-reaped harvest of seven million dollars. How comes all this if there be not something puissant in whaling? But this is not the half. Look again. I freely assert that the cosmopolite philosopher cannot, for his life, point out one single peaceful influence which, within the last sixty years, has operated more potentially upon the whole broad world, taken in one aggregate, than the high and mighty business of whaling. One way and another, it has begotten events so remarkable in themselves, and so continuously momentous in their sequential issues, that whaling may well be regarded as that Egyptian mother who bore offspring themselves pregnant from her womb. It would be a hopeless, endless task to catalogue all these things. Let a handful suffice. For many years past the whale-ship has been the pioneer in ferreting out the remotest and least known parts of the earth. She has explored seas and archipelagos which had no chart, where no Cook or Vancouver had ever sailed. If American and European men of war now peacefully ride in once savage harbours, let them fire salutes to the honour and glory of the whale-ship, which originally showed them the way and first interpreted between them and the savages. They may celebrate as they will the heroes of exploring expeditions, your cooks, your cruisensterns. But I say that scores of anonymous captains have sailed out of Nantucket that were as great and greater than your cook and your cruisenstern. For in their succorless, empty-handedness, they, in the heathenish, sharked waters and by the beaches of unrecorded javelin islands, battled with virgin wonders and terrors that Cook, with all his marines and muskets, would not willingly have dared. All that is made such a flourish of in old South Sea voyages, those things were but the lifetime commonplaces of our heroic Nantucketers. Often adventures which Vancouver dedicates three chapters to, these men accounted unworthy of being set down in the ship's common log. Ah, the world! Ah, oh, the world! Until the whale fishery rounded Cape Horn, no commerce but colonial, scarcely any intercourse but colonial, was carried on between Europe and the long line of the opulent Spanish provinces on the Pacific coast. It was the whalemen who first broke through the jealous policy of the Spanish crown, touching those colonies, and, if space permitted, it might be distinctly shown how, from those whalemen, at last eventuated the liberation of Peru, Chile, and Bolivia from the yoke of old Spain, and the establishment of eternal democracy in those parts. That great America on the other side of the sphere, Australia, was given to the enlightened world by the whalemen. After its first blunder-born discovery by a Dutchman, all other ships long shunned those shores as pestiferously barbarous. But the whale-ship touched there. The whale-ship is the true mother of that now mighty colony. Moreover, in the infancy of the first Australian settlement, the emigrants were several times saved from starvation by the benevolent biscuit of the whale-ship luckily dropping an anchor in their waters. The uncounted isles of all Polynesia confess the same truth, and do commercial homage to the whale-ship that cleared the way for the missionary and the merchant, and in many cases carried the primitive missionaries to their first destinations. If that double-bolted land, Japan, is ever to become hospitable, it is the whale-ship alone to whom the credit will be due, for already she is on the threshold." But if, in the face of all this, you still declare that whaling has no aesthetically noble associations connected with it, then I am ready to shiver fifty lances with you there, and unhorse you with a split helmet every time. The whale has no famous author, and whaling no famous chronicler, you will say. The whale no famous author, and whaling no famous chronicler? Who wrote the first account of our leviathan? Who but mighty Job? And who composed the first narrative of a whaling voyage? Who but no less a prince than Alfred the Great, who with his own royal pen took down the words from Arthur, the Norwegian whale-hunter of those times? And who pronounced our glowing eulogy in Parliament? Who but Edmund Burke? True enough, but then whalemen themselves are poor devils. 
They have no good blood in their veins. No good blood in their veins? They have something better than royal blood there. The grandmother of Benjamin Franklin was Mary Morrill, afterwards by marriage Mary Folger, one of the old settlers of Nantucket, and the ancestress to a long line of Folgers and Harpeneers, all kith and kin to the noble Benjamin, to this day darting the barbed iron from one side of the world to the other. Good again, but then all confess that somehow whaling is not respectable. Whaling not respectable? Whaling is imperial. By the old English statutory law, the whale is declared a royal fish. Oh, that's only nominal. The whale himself has never figured in any grand, imposing way. The whale never figured in any grand, imposing way. In one of the mighty triumphs given to a Roman general upon his entering the world's capital, the bones of a whale brought all the way from the Syrian coast were the most conspicuous object in the symboled procession. Footnote. See subsequent chapters for something more on this head. End of footnote. Grant it, since you cite it, but say what you will, there is no real dignity in wailing. No dignity in wailing! The dignity of our calling the very heavens attest. Cetus is a constellation in the south. No more! Drive down your hat in the presence of the Tsar and take it off to Queequeg. No more! I know a man that in his lifetime has taken three hundred and fifty whales. I account that man more honorable than that great captain of antiquity who boasted of taking as many walled towns. And as for me, if by any possibility there be any as yet undiscovered prime thing in me, if I shall ever deserve any real repute in that small but high hushed world which I might not be unreasonably ambitious of, if hereafter I shall do anything that, upon the whole, a man might rather have done than to have left undone, if at my death my executors, or more properly my creditors, find any precious manuscripts in my desk, then here I prospectively ascribe all the honor and the glory to whaling, for a whale-ship was my Yale College and my Harvard." Chapter 25. Postscript. In behalf of the dignity of whaling, I would fain advance not but substantiated facts, but after embattling his facts, an advocate who should wholly suppress a not unreasonable surmise, which might tell eloquently upon his case, such an advocate, would he not be blameworthy? It is well known that at the coronation of kings and queens, even modern ones, a certain curious process of seasoning them for their functions has gone through. There is a salt-seller of state, so-called, and there may be a caster of state. How they use the salt, precisely, who knows? Certain I am, however, that a king's head is solemnly oiled at his coronation, even as a head of salad. Can it be, though, that they anoint it with a view of making his interior run well as they anoint machinery? Much might be ruminated here concerning the essential dignity of this regal process, because in common life we esteem but meanly and contemptibly a fellow who anoints his hair and palpably smells of that anointing. In truth, a mature man who uses hair oil, unless medicinally, that man has probably got a quaggy spot in him somewhere, as a general rule, he can't amount to much in his totality. But the only thing to be considered here is this. What kind of oil is used at coronation? Certainly it cannot be olive oil, or macassar oil, nor castor oil, nor bear's oil, nor train oil, nor cod liver oil. What then can it possibly be but sperm oil in its unmanufactured, unpolluted state, the sweetest of all oils. Think of that, ye loyal Britons. We whalemen supply your kings and queens with coronation stuff. End of chapters 22 to 25